This week on the Enough Already podcast, we welcome Ben Kissel, host of a half a million podcasts, including Abe Lincoln's Top Hat, Last Podcast on the Left, and The Ben Kissel Show. We discussed Ben's recent interview with Gary Johnson, Trump's revival of the best Clinton scandals of the 1990s, and we debated what should be done about the growing heroin epidemic. Ash Scow is with us, as always, and this week she's fired up about hate crime hoaxers and campus protesters. Tracy and I discussed the IG's report about Hillary Clinton's use of private email, the rioting that took place in Albuquerque, and the exciting news that a grand total of nine gas stations in Pennsylvania have been granted the privilege of selling beer. Remember, you can always subscribe to the Enough Already podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and the TuneIn app. Enough already. Let's start the show. We have so much to talk about today. I don't even know where we should begin. We got the Trump protests in what was it, uh, New Mexico, Albuquerque, and then in Anaheim. I I haven't been able to watch much of the coverage today on what happened in Anaheim. I did see a story. Um, on Facebook that someone posted where a bunch of protesters holding a Mexican flag attacked a Trump supporter carrying an American flag. And that was in Anaheim? Yes. How oh, so lovely. Some shit went down in Anaheim. Which, of course, just means that Trump's poll numbers will continue to go up. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> And it's amazing how many of these Mexican flags there are. And they all look brand new, which is rather suspicious to me. <laughs> right. It's just so odd. I mean, it's like the nice hand print or, you know, the nice graphically designed signs that you see at what are clearly union organized protests. I'd love to know where those Mexican flags are made. I know. My guess is China. <laughs> but it could be in Mexico. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I saw some pictures from last night in uh, Albuquerque, and it looked like brand new Mexican flags there as well. Yeah, they still have the crease in it. Yes, they did. It was like kids that had them. They were wearing them as masks over their faces. Ugh. Stunning and brave how they always cover their faces. Well, it's such, a, it, it's such a stupid idea, too, to be like, oh, you know, Donald Trump wants to kick out immigrants, you know, or stop illegal immigration. Viva la Mexico. This is not the right thing. You should be like, no, we're behaved. We deserve to stay. We want to be citizens. We love this country. Wave American flags. Uh, you can't imagine this scene happening in any other country in the world. No, but that's part of the movement. If they want to reclaim the southern United States as part of Mexico. Sure. Which I, I don't even. Which apparently includes uh, beating the crap out of Trump supporters. <laughs> that will bring their territory back to Mexico. Oh, it's not just Trump supporters. It's also horses. No, there's that, too. I didn't see much. Of, you you sat up late last night watching the footage, um, not only in what was going on in um, New Mexico, um, but also what happened at DePaul. We can get into that a little bit later. But uh, for those that didn't... Uh, watch any of the of the coverage last night what did you see in which case in let's, albuquerque let's start, let's start with albuquerque well i i kicked it on at the trail end. i had seen some posts on uh, social media i think it was i think jim hoft had a piece up at gateway pundit like shots fired 
And I thought, oh, God, here we go. It's finally reached that point. Like, let me think who's going to cover this. Oh, CNN. So I immediately went to CNN. And uh, they were they had the Chiron was just like, you know, rocks are being thrown. Bottles are being thrown. One shot was fired. And this is all happening outside of the event. They said inside the event, it was mostly calm. A couple of protesters were there. They ended up getting kicked out, whatever. But from what I could tell, the event had been over for a while and there was just a mob out on the street, some guy fox masks, lots of Mexican flags, and they were squaring off against cops. And what I saw was like cops in riot gear, so with the big clear plastic shield standing in the middle of the street, forming a line and just walking and pushing, trying to move people out of the area because they had taken over an intersection. Which is, this is all so reminiscent of watching the Occupy stuff because I used to watch the live streams of all that to see what was really going on on the ground and it looks the same thing it's like the taking over the streets and I didn't hear any of the chanting whose streets are streets but I wouldn't be surprised if there was some of that I got to see uh, several of the protesters get pepper sprayed the CNN guy got pepper sprayed not purposely but he was in the vicinity so he started kind of coughing a little bit on camera um i did watch one chick get like pushed to the ground by some kind it was like a a police it was a police officer that did it and looked like a long baton a really long baton because she wouldn't move she gets pepper sprayed and then she gets smacked and goes down and then of course she's crying hysterically and saying like what did i do when you're up in the cops faces right and if people are throwing stuff, they can't tell where that's coming from. Like, I'm no big apologist for police. But if you're out inciting violence, then don't be surprised when you're coming up against the legitimate owners of violence in our society known as the police. And they tell you to back off and you don't. And then you're surprised when they try to use non-lethal force in the form of pepper spray, which I'm sure they would say is some kind of a torture, which is not. And... um you know, it does hurt, but it goes away. And here's a tip to you idiots. And I had said this last night to people that I was texting while this is all going on. I watched them, this, the, the girl that got pepper sprayed in the face and then pushed to the ground. Um, all these other people run, rush over to her to take care of her because they do have medics with them all the time. This is something else I learned watching Occupy. There's always some medic do-gooder. So the medic rushes over and what do they bring to clean up these, this girl's eyes? What do you think? Well, I would, I would, I, I don't know. I would think water. Yeah, no, water doesn't help you. It doesn't. I don't know. No, no, I'm you need milk. Expert. You need milk. milk. Okay. Yeah. Know. You need the. It's a, it's it's acidic. So if you pour water in there, it just spreads the acid. It doesn't dissipate it. So you need milk to neutralize the acid. So I said I could make a friggin' fortune at the DNC this summer selling milk packets like the little ones they used to give you in school if I could just run around with those yeah, yeah like the Capri Sun style milk and just be like here you go guys if you're not going to wear goggles like this is coming at you got to know how to deal with this I talked to someone today who mentioned uh, you know the, the protest last night and is very concerned that if Trump becomes president of the United States that we're going to see more of this and it may deter this person from supporting Trump just based on the violence in the streets. And look, we got to, these people need to be exposed for what they are. And the, the question is, will the media report this properly? And the answer is probably no, they won't. It, it no. is astonishing to me. That you'll have protests like this in Albuquerque and in Anaheim, and they'll say Trump protesters. Yes. In the headline. Yes. And for, for you know, m- many in our society, that's how they get the news. They don't actually read the story. They just read the headline. Oh, absolutely. And and looking at the Twitter feeds, and I wish I had saved these. I know I saved some pictures and like some dumb tweets. Like, oh, here we go, of protesters. Oh, that, huh? That funny. That tweets removed, but I kept a picture of it, which is the two kids with the the uh, masks across their face mm-hmm. that were made out of the Mexican flags, so that you can see the creases in still. Like their brand spanking new. The white is still white, so I'm not buying it, right? Right. Uh, but this chick was. The one that posted it, I checked out the rest of her feed to see what she was all about. And 
uh, she was arguing with people that it was perfectly okay for them to use violence. She's got a pinned tweet at the top of her page that she attributes to Malcolm X, which is a quote of his I've never heard. You can't have capitalism without racism. And I tried to find the providence of this. I can't. So she's got a video of them getting pepper sprayed while they're walking away. Anger's response to oppression is justified. And the, um, you can't tell a group of oppressed people how to act. So this is this is what they've they've totally internalized this, and they're apologists in the media. The idea that you can blame Donald Trump because of his rhetoric, rhetoric in many ways that has been mischaracterized in the media, misquoted, um, especially when it comes to illegal immigration. The idea that you can blame the the person who said those words instead of the people actually committing violence is so foreign to me, but yet is completely accepted, especially in the left-wing media. Mm-hmm. I mean, Hillary Clinton said that people, she specifically said Republicans, but I'm sure she means conservatives as well. They're her enemies. It didn't make me want to take to the streets and punch a police horse. No. <laughs> But that police for horse is obviously just a tool of the white supremacists. That's true. I mean, control yourselves, people. But I do wonder, I mean, given the backlash to the Bernie bros, which seemed to be just a creation of the anti-Bernie left, that whole idea that, that this is a, gla- a group of people that exist, that they can then malign and paint the whole movement, the Bernie movement, as these Bernie bros. Um, ever since the fallout from what happened in nevada at their caucus when you've had a big fight in the left about whether there was actually violence because there was claims that like chairs were thrown and all this stuff and there was a challenge put out like find video of this i mean it's almost reminiscent of the breitbart demand to find video of those congressmen being spat on yes and it said hey you know like i don't like jank unger from the young turks i i dislike him as a person but i know he's a big bernie guy and he was like look here you go. I will, you know, we're any anybody that has footage of this will publish it on the Young Turks. Get find it for me because I don't believe that it exists. And even Sanders himself has gone out and said, "Look, we we have no reports of this. There's video of the event. There's no video of these things be, happening." And yet we keep hearing repeated again and again in the media that our people are violent. And I, I'm starting to wonder at, at some point those guys are going to have to wake up too and realize that the media is completely in the tank for Hillary. And when you're not on their side, they'll do whatever they can to discredit and destroy you. Hillary Clinton was on the Ellen DeGeneres show today, I guess. Did you see this? No, but I read she was going on with Ghostbusters, the female Ghostbusters cast, so we can be reminded once again that she was a woman. (laughs) But it's softball after softball interview that she is is uh, a part of and Ellen conducted one today and um, one of the questions that was asked there was a QA and a on Facebook and someone asked her um, if she had seen any of the Beyonce Lemonade oh sure video mm-hmm. and she has Oh, she's got time for that. What was it? 13 hours. Remember when that movie came out and they asked her if she'd seen it? And she was like, I don't have time for such things. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, to find the piece. now. But she said she's seen some of it and she liked it. Oh, now, is there any way in hell that she do you think she could name two Beyonce songs? Uh, two. I don't. Yeah, maybe. I mean, she might be able to sing like a lyric or two. Naming an actual song might be difficult, but I wouldn't be surprised if she knew a few of the hooks. But... but I, and I wouldn't hold that against her that she doesn't no. know. Just admit it. But ladies, she's ladies she has hot man. sauce in her purse. <laughs> um, I hate to remind people, but I'm 69 years old. I don't know many Beyonce songs. And most people would be like, yeah, well, you know. Okay. That's cool. But they, they can't. You got to pander. 
Well, that's what this is all about. What, what's more ridiculous, saying that you carry hot sauce in your purse or <laughs> saying that you're you're a Beyonce fan when you're Hillary Clinton? <laughs> I think the hot sauce thing. <laughs> oh, man. She doesn't even carry a purse, does she? Uh, Hillary? Like yeah, no, she doesn't carry a purse. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been embarrassing as she was getting on the subway if her hot sauce dropped out of her purse? And broke on the platform. <laughs> that would have been horrible. It felt so bad for her. I think I saw Rush Limbaugh said this a couple of days ago. That the media is so dishonest that Trump, by coming up um, or bringing up all of these old stories of, about the Clintons, he's doing the media vetting for the media because they won't do it. Yeah. <laughs> and... It's going to be a very interesting six months here to watch this take the softball interviews that Hillary is is going to take part in compared to the same media interviewing down. They had Donald Trump's daughter on the other day. Um, I think it was I think it was ABC, but it may have been CNN and immediately attacking her for. Donald's continuing uh, to bring up uh, Bill Clinton's past. And it's been brought up on several occasions. Can you imagine them doing that to Chelsea? You know? No. And, and it, it's so funny because what did the New York Times do? They tried to drudge up Trump's past. Yeah. And talk to all these women that he was supposedly so horrible to that then all immediately turned around and said, uh, the times took me out of context. <laughs> no, they totally changed like the tenor of what I was saying. Donald Trump was great to me. So and that was like stories from the 80s and 90s. And so give me a break. This stuff is totally on limits. If there is, you know, if we're going with the opposite of off limits, this is on limits and they never delved into all these problems with the Clintons in the 90s. No. It was always dismiss, dismiss, dismiss. You know, Carville, and they had that whole defense squad out there just trashing anybody that came along the way to bring up some scandal. And just scratching the surface, you know, there's a big story out today that one, I guess somebody accidentally emailed their plans, the Trump team's plans to go after Clinton over the White Wall water stuff oh really yeah they accidentally emailed somebody at politico because they have the same last name i guess as somebody in the rnc so it says uh trump campaign spokeswoman hope hicks had been copied by somebody whose last name is caputo who's a trump advisor and then when she responded to a guy with the same last name at politico and so they, Politico got a hold of these things talking about how they wanted, you know, oppo on, uh, on Whitewater. And it's just like, yeah, we could relitigate that. I guarantee you no millennial has ever heard of it. People right. went to jail over that. It's shocking that they would do something like that. <laughs> Meanwhile, everyone knows at one point Mitt Romney strapped the family dog on the right, right. <laughs> roof of his car and uh, cut some kid's hair on the playground when he was like, what, 16 years old? Yeah, we, boarding school, a little bit of hazing. Yeah, we yeah, can delve into that. Yeah, <laughs> cool. but, you know, people going to jail for like this, you know, fr this giant scheme. And that's just the tip. You've got Whitewater, you've got Travelgate, you've got Chinagate. Which you and I, I think, talked about earlier the, this week. It was just all those Chinese donors that were funneling money to them in the same kind of like setup as the Clinton Foundation. I think they were funneling it to the Democrat Party, though, at the yeah, time I in the think, 90s. I believe if I remember correctly, it happened toward the end of his administration. And, you know, it, it just got completely overshadowed by the 2000 election. No, it was going on uh, simultaneous to the Lewinsky stuff. Oh, it was? Yeah, I just saw a YouTube video about it that was that was called like China Gate, and it was totally overshadowed by the Lewinsky stuff. Oh, okay. And so they they, they were selling access. Don't you remember there were people sleeping in the Lincoln oh, yeah, bedroom? Lincoln bedroom was up for rent. And there was some whole scandal with them and like the Chiquita banana. Oh my God! Do you remember that? 
I. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be like a greatest hits album, you know? Right, but it's all stuff that was never properly flushed out in the media. Like, people don't know all this stuff. It always got kind of poo pooed. Well, yeah, I remember seeing the. Gosh, it must have been in the late 90s. I got a copy of some documentary about the Clintons and Mesa. I think it was Mesa. Is it Mesa, Arkansas? Uh-huh. The the air strip there where they were bringing it, cocaine in and out. <laughs> yeah, to fund the Contras. Yeah, the, 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 there was the whole Clintons were involved in the, in the in the drug trade and people were being offed and the whole... I mean, and, you know, of course, it was filmed on a $15 budget. <laughs> yeah, it's decent. It's up on... I can't... I want to say it's called, like, the Clinton Chronicles or something like that. I watched I watched it maybe a year or two ago. It's on YouTube. Um, But that was put out in 92. That was 92. put out... I think that was put out during the first go-around, you know, his first run for the presidency to try to stop it. And it was put out by a guy that had been one of their, their hatchet men that just got disgusted when they started being like, hey, can you kill those two kids that saw the plane flying over that was going to land in this this airstrip in Mensa that was full of cocaine? And uh, I believe that's the story. I don't know. I heard Alex Jones talking about it on Anthony Cumia the other day, and it reminded me about that, that that was who made that film. But then you've got Waco. You've got Oklahoma City. Yeah. Which there's a lot of weird stuff around that. Both of those, including the assertion, at least made by Vince Foster's widow, that the reason Vince killed himself, which is what I believe happened, except I believe he did it in the White House and was subsequently moved out of there, was because of the guilt he felt over the Waco siege. And there are a lot of people that say it was Hillary's call to go in there. Hmm. So, yeah. There's a lot of stuff that we haven't really gotten to the bottom of with those two. I say bring it all to the fore. And that's just the 90s. <laughs> we haven't even gotten into the amassing of hundreds of millions of dollars. Personally, and then the foundation. It's, it's, it's obscene. They're, I'm, they're showing right now on Fox News. That, first of all, there were eight arrested today in Anaheim. Oh, and they were showing the protests and a guy yelling at the Trump protesters. And he had it. You're right. He's like brand spanking new Mexican flags. Yes. It's amazing. And they're they're kind of rehashing what went on last night. The horse got punched. Yeah, I saw a picture of a horse getting knocked over. It was like in mid fall. And that's dangerous. I mean, we all know that if a horse breaks its leg, you have to kill it, right? Yeah. There, there's, Isn't that what we learned in all the Western movies? Yeah, exactly. Someone pushed a dumpster at one of the horses. Oh nice. I mean, just classy. But the headlines are ridiculous. I'm looking at the L.A. Times. Several arrested after Trump supporters and opponents square off at a rally. It's so intellectually dishonest what's going on here. I've been to at least one Trump rally. People walk in, they walk out. Everything's fine. But if you get someone pelting them with water bottles and and uh, throwing other shit at them, you know, something may happen. Well, and, and I haven't I got to look gross. and make sure sure that that report of the shots being fired turned out to be correct. I saw this morning that the Albuquerque police stated that they did there were no shots fired. Okay, because I saw that being said on uh, CNN, and that's what Jim uh, Hoft is reporting as well. I think Fox said it, CNN said it too, maybe. So I don't know. But I mean, can you imagine just even a report of shots fired at a Hillary Clinton event? Ugh. Yeah, some tea partiers show up, talking yeah. to Hillary people as they're going into an event, and then cause all of this bullshit outside. This it would be it, accurately reported then. Yeah, it would be called a riot. These are riots. 
Yes. What I saw last night on television in Albuquerque was a riot. It's not a peaceful protest. They're just being provoked, Tracy, by oh, Donald sh- Trump's rhetoric. <laughs> sure. <laughs> When he tells like who's gonna we're gonna build a wall and who's gonna pay for it and everybody chants back Mexico and then there's a whole bunch of laughing like that's really scary. <laughs> that just but like makes you me said, wanna, this makes me want to go out and punch a horse. <laughs> <laughs> makes me want to do. It's it's funny, but it's not funny because it's really happening. Yeah. And it doesn't seem, and I don't know where I would go to see this to see anybody chastising this kind of behavior. If any of these lefty sites have taken it upon themselves to say, hey, guys, not. knock this stuff off, because, you know, that if anything similar to this happened at Tea Party events, of which I've probably been to, I don't know, 10 or 15. Yeah. And some pretty big ones. I didn't see any cops in riot gear. I didn't see any of this stuff. But if there had been anything like that, I remember the few times that people will still maintain to this day that it was all leftist infiltrators that came in wearing like neo-Nazi stuff. People were asking them to leave. Right. And I, trying to clean up their own movement. And this stuff, it's just it's encouraged. You you go to a Tea Party rally in, in D.C. and the mall there and the mall looks better after the rally ends. People pick it's up, absolutely their, pick up their shit. <laughs> you know, these freaks show up. There was some uh, event. I was in D.C. the same week, and they had it was their, it was their rally, and every grievance group showed up at the mall. And afterwards, we took pictures. Trash everywhere. I mean, they just dropped their shit. You know, um, American flags on the ground in the trash. It was just disgusting, and it never reported. Never. No, and then people give me crap for watching RT. Yeah, this is a riot. <laughs> this is an absolute riot. They're showing footage from last night. They're in the middle of the streets, stomping on police cars. Oh, that's where the woman got shoved. Yep. And she's uh, dressed for a protest in her short denim shorts and knee-high socks. Oh, is this the one that you just saw the chick that got shoved wearing yeah. like a... She's basically wearing like a sports bra or something, right? Yeah. She has, yeah. But I mean, don't tell me you're coming out for a rally when you're wearing a mask. Right. I, I don't believe you're you. Out there, you're, you're going out there for one thing, and it's to cause trouble. Absolutely. Yeah, he's got uh, a really courageous. This one guy has his face covered, and he's 10 feet from the cops flipping him off. Yes. And yet these are the same people that will tell us that the cops are just on a murder spree. Right? They're just out to kill everybody, especially brown and black bodies. Right. And I saw a lot of uh, brown and black bodies there facing off with the cops, and they all walked away, maybe with a little pepper spray. But I didn't see this just massive shootout go down and a whole bunch of innocents get slaughtered. Yeah, there would be 500 people dead. If the police yes. really behaved in a way that Black Lives Matter claim that they behave. And there are plenty of times where you can criticize police for, for going well uh, above and beyond what they should, what they, how they go beyond procedure. And no, no, no person you know, getting stopped at a traffic stop should be killed by the police. Absolutely not. And nobody selling loose cigarettes on the street should be killed by the police. Right. But come on, Let, let's let's get real. Last night was a to me seeing the footage that I'm seeing. I feel like the police were incredibly restrained. Yeah, I think they've been really restrained through all of this. I mean, g- being on site at some of those things, I've been to a lot of the lefty protests because I enjoy them and I think it's fun to see that stuff up close. Yeah, but it's infuriating, and I don't know if I had the legal right to have a gun and like, I mean, I do have the legal right to have a gun, but I mean, if I thought that I could get away with it or I was in a little position of power and I had a big long billy club and a whole can of pepper spray, if I wouldn't just be, if I would be able to keep my cool and not be like you filthy maggots, 
that are out here trying to destroy civilization. You're throwing a hissy fit in the street because somebody's inside there that's saying something that you don't like and there are other people that like what he said and you can't process that. Somebody finally saying, we should do something about people who are breaking the law. (laughs) (laughs) People can't handle it, so they go, (laughs) they take the streets and break the law. This is unbelievable. It's it, it's absolutely crazy. And this pops up every every couple of years, though. I mean, this is cyclical. This is the 60s. Yeah. All over again. And I, it's going to be amazing to see how this unfolds in Philadelphia. And, oh, and Cleveland. It, Cleveland will be a blip, I think, compared to... To Philadelphia. Yeah, especially, it, and it's not going to happen, but if Bernie could somehow pull it off in California. Oh, if he ends up winning California? Uh, be wonderful. The reaction will be over the top. Because at the end of the day, say if he wins uh, 52 48. And she still walks away with more delegates in California and then clinches, <laughs> clinches the nomination. Uh, oh, yeah. Wow. What, what, these, these people are really making a bold statement by burning Trump paraphernalia in the middle of the street. Wow. What a powerful message. Well, I mean, I've seen idiots be like, I would do the same, you know, like this is what people should have done when Hitler was coming to power. Oh, idiots. I would have done the same thing for Hitler. It's like, oh, God. You people are ridiculous. And to your friend that said, you know, I don't know if I can vote for Trump because this stuff is just going to continue. This stuff has been going on for the last seven years. Do you think if Hillary wins, it's not it's going to stop? Well, no, I think the difference being that if Trump wins and this stuff starts happening, he's going to get up and say, like, this is I mean, just a stern talking to so that everybody else doesn't feel intimidated by this stuff. And you see, like, once somebody stands up and speaks up, then other people feel empowered. This is what pisses me off. Has anybody said this is wrong today? Anyone? I haven't seen any of the coverage, so I don't know. I haven't seen – look, I haven't watched um, much in the way cable news today, but I've been online a a lot today. And I haven't seen anyone say, so-and-so denounced the violence in Albuquerque. Oh, nobody had to make any denunciations? Disavow the protesters? Yeah, why, where's the media sticking a, uh, a microphone. microphone in Hillary Clinton's face saying, you know, this is clearly violence uh, perpetrated by the left. Do you denounce what's going on in Albuquerque? Can you, uh, two Tea Partiers, if they... If they pulled some shenanigans at an event, there would be microphones in every Republican on the Hill in their faces. Mm-hmm. Be asking Trump, everybody from the Trump campaign, people who haven't joined the Never Trump movement, those people would be asked too to denounce it. And meanwhile, this this happens on a regular basis. And nobody ever has to denounce anything on the left. Yeah, I'm looking through Bernie's Twitter feed right now, and it doesn't look like he said a word about it. Stunning. No, and if anything, I could find stuff. I mean, if I was as as disgusting as the left, I could find some inciting things on here. He's got a video up for California, and it shows a Viva La Raza, a guy in a Viva La Raza t-shirt. That means long live the race. Seems pretty racist to me. Yeah. Don't you think? Let's go then, stop some cop cars. <laughs> right. Here's a goodie for you. It's a, a little bit off track, but you're going to get a kick out of this. This is a tweet from today from Sanders. A trillion dollar investment in infrastructure could create 13 million decent paying jobs. We need to invest in infrastructure, not more war. I agree with the, the not more war stuff. But can we do a flashback to 2009? Yeah. What did we drop on that? Was it eight? It, I think it ended up rounding up to about a trillion. Yeah, I think so. I think they originally said it was going to be seven hundred billion. 
Yeah. But just like anything else, when it comes to the government, they underestimate what they're going to spend. Mm-hmm. And then it's a trillion dollars. We should have gold plated, gold paved roads and plated bridges. <laughs> right. With the money we spent. <laughs> but president after president and state after un- state of the union after state of the after oh my god state of the union after state of the union address, it's always one paragraph in the state of the union address about our crumbling roads and bridges. Yeah, you would think that we live in the third world. And I've talked about what it was like driving across the the country of Venezuela. And that was in 2000 before everything there collapsed, which is still going on, by the way. They're just not reporting it anymore. But uh, our roads compared to theirs. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, come on. And this whole idea still like at least twice a week, I see lefties yelling at libertarians like myself about, oh, my God, you don't want government like the roads, which is the stupidest argument. Who would build the roads? And I want to say, like, do you think the government's out there building the roads right now? <laughs> no. They just steal the money from us to build the roads. So we could just get that money in a different way, or we could leave the uh, tax that's placed on a gallon of gasoline in place or implement some kind of a user fee. You know, we have this thing called Easy Pass, and we have toll roads already. So let's not I, I lose our minds over how this. They make the leap from. Well, the government takes care of the roads, so they should run our health care system. Yeah. <laughs> they well, do such a splendid no, but, job with the roads. But they go backwards, too. I mean, it's no government means no roads. Like, that's the first thing that they point to yeah. all the time. And um, I can't remember where I saw a rant earlier today. I wanted to... Was it an Elizabeth Warren? No, I, maybe it was on Counterpunch or something like that. I was reading Counterpunch, which is a lefty site. And there was actually a decent article about Venezuela on there calling out all the leftists mm-hmm. that haven't denounced or disavowed Venezuela. You know, the ones that ran and applauded it and thought it was this <laughs> amazing triumph of socialism. And now most of them are hiding either in hiding or they're saying, oh, okay, well, Chavez was still really good. And it's just because he died and Maduro took over. That's what really happened. And, you know, Maduro's government is out putting out this line that it's the United States' fault. Yes. Which is so incredibly crazy. (laughs) But that's what happens when you have government-controlled media down there that this is all the people are hearing, but it's pretty obvious with, like, what's going on in the streets and stuff like that. that's the fallback with all these cats. You know, yeah. the, the Iranians, they it's its always American meddling. Sure. That's causing the problem. Of course. Of course. But I, I appreciated this guy had the balls to stand up to his fellow lefties and be like, hey, guys, it's OK to, to say, oh, there's a leftist government that fell apart. <laughs> they were terrible. They were authoritarian nutjobs that have like jailed. Or killed their political opponents. They've held sham elections. They've stolen hundreds of millions of dollars from the poor people in their countries and stashed it overseas. <laughs> like, <laughs> we can just admit this. It doesn't mean that we have to give up on our, whereas I would argue, you should admit it and give up on your stupid ideology because that's what happens. Yes. But I appreciated this. But I feel like it was in the same, same, um, on the same site, Counterpunch, but I might be totally wrong about this. But I was reading something about, um, libertarians. No, you know what? It actually was somewhere different. I'll have to find it and I'll put it up on the Facebook page. But it was uh, something about libertarian and their hypocrisy and, you know, lim- lumping Ayn Rand in there when you can go and read what she said about libertarians. And this was, she was a contemporary of theirs. Like the Libertarian Party was founded in 1971. So she was alive and running her mouth at that time. You know, she was out there doing stuff and she knew some of the guys that founded it and she disagreed with them. She called them like hippies all the time. <laughs> and she, that was not a good word in, in her world. So it but it's just funny. She's always equated with them, whatever. So it was just this whole article about how hypocritical libertarians are. It was, it was unreasoned and p- poorly argued. But one of the contentions in there was just like, Oh yeah, you want to? You don't like the government, but like you owe everything to them. You, like even you tech guys or something like this. It's like you you would not have employees if it weren't for public schools educating people or the roads that got them there. And I'm like, oh my god, are you serious? This is how pathetic your arguments are. 
that you're like the poor education system that we receive, which is mandatory, by the way. Ask anybody that try to take their kid out of school to homeschool them the amount of crap you have to go through just to be able to do what you want with your own child. And then we're supposed to say, oh, thank you to the state. And you're a hypocrite as somebody that doesn't believe the government should have that much power if you employ people that went through government schools. If you give me a workforce that wasn't exposed to that and were homeschooled, I'd happily take them if they were qualified. Well, but this is all they know. You know, but you, it's go just back a- to, you go back to um, the argument about, uh, I, I saw it somewhere today, someone freaking out over the idea of, um, of us eliminating the Department of Education. Like uh-huh. It's been around for, uh, you know, 150 <laughs> years. It's, it's Yeah, it's, uh, it's in Article 1. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, Congress was charged with setting up a Department of Education and overseeing all of that. I mean, what what did we say a week or two ago? The budget for the Department of Education was was it seventy seven billion dollars? It's it's tiddlywinks. They they uh, account for I think one percent of all spending, like at all federal. Um, oh, excuse me, all educational spending. And Gary Johnson, that's something that he's been talking about. And so if he's if his numbers are be to be believed in the interview he did with Joe Rogan, he said that 10 cents of every dollar in the schools is is federal money. So they're sorry. So it's not one percent, it's 10 percent. But he said every 10 cents, those 10 cents come with 15 cents worth of obligations. Right. So that's it's a it, problem. Mm hmm. And we continue to give Washington, D.C. and the Department of Education more power. The idea that conservatives or people who claim to be conservative will stand up and say, I don't mind having a national curriculum. It's no, crazy. it's gross. It's gross. It, it makes no sense. I, and it just to, to give that kind of power. If I'm pissed off about what my kids are being taught at their schools, I want to be able to go to the school board and bitch about it. I don't want the school board to look at me and say, well, I'm sorry. This is all thought out and planned in Washington, D.C. You have to talk to them. It should all be local control. I thought that's what the right believed in. Well, it should be local control for that reason, but also because it's easier to make advancements and improvements and innovate if it's locally controlled. If you have to go through the federal bureaucracy to get changes made it's going to take forever and considering like our entire economy is going to look completely different in 20 years just like 20 years ago looks completely different than now think about like the biggest names in industry right now are mostly tech and internet related fields that nobody nobody foresaw that in the 1980s and 1990s when we were growing up and if they had had an inkling of it it would have been smarter in school to teach us I learned typing in school, but I know you didn't because you're a hunter pecker. I had a typing class, but it would have been smart to have us in coding classes and those kind of things. And just for seeing the technolo- technological advancements and what's that's, what that's going to do. And my contention has been since I've looked into like the history of school and like what school intends to do, which is not educate you clearly. It's just like it's pretty simple. To have a pop, if you teach children critical thinking skills and problem solving skills and these kind of things, they'll be okay. You know, I've seen lefties be like, oh my God, if we did away with the Department of Education, which is what the libertarian candidates are saying, and they were responding to, um, I think Johnson said that on Rogan's show too, I would like get rid of the Department of Education, which is something that Trump has said too. And they're just like, oh my God, then all the Southern schools are just going to turn into these like, I don't know what they're never going to teach evolution again as if that would cripple our economy. What does that have to do with anything? Uh, again, the uh, leftists would, you know, they don't care what the state of the economy is. Um, you know, what unemployment is like, as long as the president of the United States believes in evolution, mm-hmm. they're cool with that. So they can. It's simply amazing to me that they would dismiss a great leader based on the fact that you know they may not believe in evolution. It's 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 insane. How how does that affect anyone's life? If if you if we could have a president that would privatize Social Security, privatize Medicare, 
get rid of the Department of Education, the Food and Drug Administration, and about five or six other agencies that I can't even you know think of off the top of my head right now um, that what I would sure. want eliminated. Um, he could pray to a picture of you, Tracy. That well, that would be fine with me, and I'd be fine with it. Yeah, he could believe that David Ike's like that. There's a whole bunch of lizard people living on the dark side of the moon. I don't care. It, like it doesn't affect any of the rest of it, and I mean. Th- they just hold so many inconsistent views. And this t- demonstrates clearly to me that they were not taught about even basic logic. Like if everybody had to take just formal logic class, just quick overviews, which you can learn by going to your logical And it's just a tool that helps you spot contradictions and arguments or look at somebody's statement and say, oh, OK, they're employing this, which makes this logically invalid. And if you can work that kind of stuff out then it makes life a little bit easier and you know when you're being lied to or not and you can actually get to truth. But these people aren't interested in any of that. They would never want you thinking for yourself and it kind of makes sense that if the government's in charge of education, do they really want you thinking for yourself? Well, no. Then you're going to question all this stuff. Right. Which brings me to the IG report, the OIG report that came out today on Clinton's email stuff. It's really stunning. And, and they basically admit in here how... How inept they are over multiple departments. So this was the the investigation that they started conducting uh, the uh, Office of the Inspector General into the records keeping and management in this in the Department of State. And in the little summary of it, what they found. I love this. Ready. So what OIG found, the uh, Federal Records Act provides appropriate management and preservation of federal records. Regardless of physical forms or characteristics, the document, the organization, functions, policies, decisions, procedures, and essential transactions of an agency. For the last two decades, both Department of State policy and federal regulations have explicitly stated that emails may qualify as federal records. So did you get that for the last two decades? Yes. Okay. This is the kicker. As is the case Throughout the federal government, management weaknesses at the department have contributed to the loss or removal of email records, particularly records created by the office of the secretary. As is the case throughout the federal government, management weakness. (laughs) It's just like, wait, what? So you guys all suck. Yeah, and that's that's throughout this thing, and that's I, and it, it, will that be the defense at the end of the day if they if they really report this in the mainstream media will <laughs> will that will be the the main talking point? Well, everybody does it. Well, Why are I, we I think, singling her out. I think that'll be a lot of it, and um, that's a logical fallacy in and of itself. Called two quoquet. It means you too. <laughs> Basically, um, well, what they can point to in this, the Hillary people, because what they did was they looked at the Secretary of State's records going all the way back to Albright. And when Albright was there, she didn't use email because email wasn't really around. But Colin Powell did. And he used a private email address. And he never turned over his records. So they can point to Powell and which they do. Actually, there's a there's a section in here where they say that Hillary's staffers actually pointed to Powell's usage of private email when he was as their standard but Condoleezza Rice apparently didn't use email which is strange to me but um, there's a lot of interesting stuff about how inept the entire system is and it's just failure after failure and agencies that you've never heard of and it also revealed to me that Cheryl Mills who has been with the Clintons since the 90s and acted as, I believe, Clinton's chief of staff at state, was also considered her lawyer while they were at state. Or at least this is how it reads to me. So last week or the week before, there she was being interviewed by the FBI, maybe, and stormed out. Do you remember that story? She went Cheryl, out of the, Cheryl Mills. Yeah, yeah. She, briefly she stepped out to consult with her lawyer and then came back because apparently um, she was being asked questions that they originally said they, they were not going to ask. Yes, and then they came back and asserted attorney-client privilege. Right. So people were speculating like, wait, so she was her lawyer? While she was at state, she was also Hillary's lawyer? And that that's... Sense, but- no, but I mean, Huma had three other jobs. 
Well, she was at state. She was working for the foundation and I think Teneo Consulting and and a couple other things. But I mean, this is pretty damning. This report and they but they try to to sugarcoat it and saying um, they were all supposed to supply their records when they left and people had talked about this form that you're supposed to sign when you leave. And I had gone and researched it to see if she had actually signed this exit form. And um, it's called like a 109, DS-109 or something like this. And um, you're supposed to sign it when you leave saying that you've surrendered all your documentation that related to your official government business that was created. And this includes emails, which they've made perfectly clear throughout this. And um, I went and searched the Internet first before I read further. And Paul Ryan's office had put out like a statement. You know, we want to know whether or not Hillary Clinton signed this form DS-109. Like we should know that, right? She's supposed to. Mm-hmm. Well, this report says that the government is so incompetent that <laughs> they were told that uh, the secretaries of state are not asked to follow the, ex- the exit process of other employees. So consequently, secretaries Albright, Powell, Rice, and Clinton did not sign that form at the end of their tenures. Wow. Yes. I'm looking at the employment numbers at the Department of State. Uh huh. 13,000 Foreign Service employees, 11,000 Civil Service employees, 45,000 Foreign Service local employees. Yep. Annual budget uh, just shy of $66 billion. <sighs> I would really like to see that report just to be able to publicize the agencies you're talking about that no one's ever heard of and research how many people work at those agencies and what their budgets are. So when whenever you hear Nancy Pelosi say there's nothing to cut. Right, right, right. <laughs> you can point to that report and say, well, listen, I think that the American people are fine with cutting all these agencies being that none of them have ever heard of them before. Well, like the National Record, the National Archives Records Administration, who's quoted throughout here. I didn't know that was a deal. And they've got a bunch of people working for them. So you're supposed to notify the NARA of the loss of any records. And this is a federal law. So if you lose them or they're not put into the record, you're supposed to let them know. And they um, they didn't make a formal request for all the former secretaries to turn over these emails is part of this and so they didn't properly and none of these officials notified these guys and this is one of the things that came up is like oh they might have violated the national archives records act or whatever okay great so um so this is it just gets so confusing the um Nobody told I so I guess this was state was supposed to tell the National Archives that um, they didn't have these emails and they didn't promptly notify them of this. So then the NARA officials told the OIG. So this is so riddled with these acronyms. It's ridiculous that they learned of former Secretary Clinton's email practices through media accounts in 2015. And then immediately thereafter, they requested the department to provide the report, uh, a report concerning the potential alienation of federal email records created by former Secretary of State. So they're saying that they didn't even find out about this until March of 2015. But meanwhile, we knew about it because of the Benghazi Committee. In 2013, I think this first came to light. Mm-hmm. So th- this is just, it's so crazy. So there's a footnote, and they hit a lot of stuff in these footnotes, Right. So a footnote to this this little, um, the NARA must be notified of these potential loss of records. The footnote is in May of 2014, the department, which is the State Department, undertook efforts to recover potential federal records from Secretary Clinton. Thereafter, in July of 2014, senior officials met with former members of Security Clinton's immediate staff, who were then acting as Secretary Clinton's representatives. So I don't know if this is Mills. That's what I'm reading between the lines. But at that meeting, her representative indicated that her practice of using a personal email account was based on Secretary Colin Powell's similar use. 
But department staff instructed Clinton's representatives to provide the department with any federal records transmitted through her personal system. So this is all in 2014. This is before the National Archives even figure out that this is going on. Mm -hmm. Then, on August 22nd, 2014, Secretary Clinton's former chief of staff and then representative. So this is Mills. It has to be, right? Yeah. Representative is what they're calling her, even though she, that's her attorney. Advised department leadership that hard copies of the secretary's emails containing responsive information would be provided, but that given the volume of emails, it would take some time to produce. So that goes on a little bit more and it gets boring. But... um They've subsequently come and found out, which is reported in here, that they didn't turn over all the emails. There's gaps, which we knew about. Right. There are a couple months of gap in her email reporting, and there were emails that showed up on, in Petraeus's email that she had responded to, but they weren't turned over from her side of the conversation. Has then, has anybody asked Colin Powell about this? Yeah, they have quotes of his and being like, oh, he kind of I mean, his quotes kind of exonerate her a little oh, bit. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. But there are all kinds of security things talked about. Like they were had the State Department was hacked. Hillary's email server was pulled offline at least once. Because of a potential of a hack. And uh, it also lost power during its Superstorm Standy. So she was down. Yeah, here's Powell's quote. He went on TV and talked about his use of email. And he said, uh, to compliment the official Secretary of State computer in my office, I installed a laptop computer on a private line. My personal email account on the laptop allowed me direct access to anyone online. I started shooting emails to my principal assistants, to individual ambassadors, and increasingly to my foreign minister colleagues. And you do have to keep in mind, we're talking about 2001 to 2005. Right. And they said that the, in this, they say that the email system that was set up at that time in state was only dealt, you could only basically talk to other people in the State Department. This is how pathetic our government is with their technology. It's amazing that they have email. Well, it is. I don't know if you saw the report today, but they're still doing stuff on floppy disk. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. It doesn't surprise me. I work for a corporation... Um, I won't mention their name, but mm -hmm. the, the computers that they use, they still work, you know, for what they're supposed to be used for at work. I think they run Windows 6. Yeah, no, these are on floppies, and this is the Pentagon, I think it was. Floppy disks. I haven't seen one of those since I turned double digits in age. <laughs> I'm serious. But so the NARA is kind of uh, letting her off the hook because the deal is that you have to if you have any records in your possession or if you figure out that you used emails and they weren't getting into the preserve system, which if you'll remember this, that was one of their contentions that, oh, she was emailing people at their dot gov account. So that meant they were getting into the system. And this says in this report, that's not true. Mm. It's not necessarily true. And the the rules are that if you do that, you're supposed to turn over hard copies within 30 days. So this is so pathetic. They say that the NRA, uh, NARA agrees with a foregoing assessment told the OIG that Secretary Clinton's production of 55,000 pages of emails mitigated her failure to properly preserve emails that qualified as federal records during her tenure and to surrender such records on her departure. The OIG concurs with NARA but also notes, don't get this, Secretary Clinton's production was incomplete. For example, the Department of OIG both determined that the production included no email covering the first few months of Secretary Clinton's tenure from January 21st of 2009 through March 17th of 2009 for received messages and from January 21st, 2009 to April, 20, April 12th, 2009 for sent messages, which is totally bizarre. So she's getting received emails we have a three month block out and for sent we've got a four month but my the the problem with all this is that when you start digging into this this is where you're going to start losing the american people sure oh absolutely absolutely and this is it goes on uh in this period the defense department provided oig 
in September 2015 with copies of 19 emails between Secretary Clinton and General Petraeus on his official Department of Defense email account. These 19 emails were not in the Secretary's 55,000-page production. They also learned that it did not contain some emails that an external contact not employed by the State Department sent to Hillary regarding department business. So they're trying to get all this straightened out, which, of course, she's being shifty about. And then want to get into... Oh, and her aides, of course, were doing this as well which they talk about so four of her top aides who refuse to be interviewed and they don't have to be and the OIG has no subpoena power so um, they, I think it's four of them they talked about they had 72,000 pages in hard copies of their emails that they hadn't turned over and made available 7.5 gigs of electronic data it's unreal that's a hell of a lot of data yeah so they had to turn them over too and they've been really cagey about it. And it says who they are, but it only gives their title and not their names, which is irritating as hell. Like, why aren't you naming them? Why are we protecting anonymity? You're just making me do a Google search right. to find out that you're probably talking about Cheryl Mills, Huma Abedin, and who knows who the other two are. Um, I did find that the, the article about the floppy disks. Oh, well, please share. I hope it's not <laughs> in the Department of Defense. Oh, yeah, it is. Uh, this is a CNBC article that came out today. Um, the headline is U.S. military uses 8-inch floppy disks to get this. Coordinate nuclear force operations. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, it's by Dan Maggan. Um, maybe they use the 80s flick war games as a trading film, too. The U.S. Defense Department is still using, after several decades, 8-inch floppy disks in a computer system that coordinates the operational functions of the nation's nuclear forces. A jaw-dropping new report reveals the Defense Department's 1970s-era IBM Series 1 computer and long-outdated floppy disks handle functions related to intercontinental ballistic missiles, nuclear bombers, and tanker support aircraft, <laughs> according to a new government accountability office. Almighty. There's another fun government office for you. The Government Accountability Office. A joke. So the department's, out, the department's outdated Strategic Automatic Command and Control System is one of the 10 oldest information technology investments our systems detailed in a sobering GAO report, which calls for a number of federal agencies to, quote, address aging legacy systems. This is so crazy. They say later in this article that they spend something... Um, yeah, more than 70% of the $80 billion budgeted for federal IT efforts across all agencies in fiscal year 2015 was spent on operations and maintenance investments. And such spending has increased in the past seven years. So it sounds like instead of just getting new computers every five years, they've just kept these computers <laughs> <laughs> like an IBM Series 1. And again, <laughs> what? our friends on the left want them to be in charge of our health care. <laughs> yeah remember when they tried to build that neato website <laughs> but i mean this is staggering because that's another thing that i've heard just ugh, disgusting leftists like intellectual midgets be like but the government created the internet so like we need government They're like oh okay they created the internet and it took it took the private market to explode it into what it was what it is and um, if you want to see what the government would have done with it, check out the fact that they're using IBM Series 1 computers and floppy disks. You think it would be anywhere near what it is today if we had just left it in their control? We'd be lucky to have dial-up. Absolutely. It's nuts. I'm looking at, uh, you, know, you know, I hate using Wikipedia, but what the hell I'm using Wikipedia. The U.S. Sure. Department of State, their Wikipedia page. And the amount of... You know, going back to the the staff that I mentioned earlier, um, and the but they have the organizational chart of the U.S. Department of State as of March 2014, and the amount of offices and uh -huh. bureaus. It's simply stunning. I mean, just going down the 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 list. I mean, uh, Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs. Of course. Bureau of Overseas Buildings Operations. How would you like to have a job with them? <laughs> they probably don't do anything. Right. Bureau of Energy Resources. Okay. What do they do? 
The Bureau of Energy Resources is an agency in the United States Department of State that coordinates the department's efforts in promoting international energy security. Oh, you mean like running our nuclear program off of floppy disks? <laughs> I mean, I get it that it's a nuclear weapons program, but still. Their budget is uh, $16 million. Well, that's... And they have 91 employees. Oh, my God. <laughs> but that reminds me, one of these people that I found in this report that I had never heard of, apparently the State Department has a transparency coordinator. Uh-huh. And that transparency coordinator wasn't able to uh, keep track of all the emails. Well, <laughs> they're storing under Secretary of Clinton, discs. <laughs> right? And <laughs> well, no, no, they weren't storing them on floppy disks. Discs. They actually finally realized, I guess, dicks. that you. <laughs> I, yes, I did. Um, they finally realized that you can do this like neato thing with emails where they just kind of like save themselves. So they mm-hmm. they've tried to implement a system that I believe is called smart to, to just archive emails, which I've been doing for years through my Gmail account. So, <laughs> but that federal government, if the internet had been left to them, man, and uh, <laughs> there's a place called another agency that I had never heard of, um, the Office of Information Programs and Services. With I, I, and I can't even tell like if these are sub agencies in the State Department or if these are just standalones. I, I wonder if anybody has a full list of all of the these. It's unreal. I'm just looking through here. Office of Protocol. Uh-huh. Uh, Which is what? How to fold a flag correctly? <laughs> exactly. Where to, I'm serious. Where to put the salad fork <laughs> at a state dinner. Yep. Uh-huh. Which China to use. <laughs> the office of the global AIDS coordinator. Oh. They must be overworked with Cuban super AIDS on the run. <laughs> Glo- that sounds so bizarre, right? Global AIDS coordinator? Yeah. The Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator is the president's main task force to combat global AIDS. The Global AIDS Coordinator reports directly to the Secretary of State. Of course. Uh, The Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. I'm sorry, what? The Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. It's a bureau within the United States Department of State. The bureau is under the purview of... Of the Under Secretary of State for Civil Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights, their budget is thirty nine million dollars as of two thousand three. That's the last report. Hundred employees. That sounds like they're the labor union's liaison. Nowhere to trim in the federal. Not budget. a single thing can be cut. Bureau of Arms mm-hmm. Control, uh, Verification and Compliance. Okay. But yeah, but That's we have okay. something called the ATF. You're reading, these are all State Department things, correct? Yes, but I thought it was, uh, yeah, w- dealing with arms control, non proliferation, well, it- and disarmament. Oh, uh, that's going really well. <laughs> <laughs> Office of the Historian. Sure, that's we don't have the National Archives. That's a whole friggin' department. Why? This is redundancies, yes. Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. <sighs> Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration. Oh, this should be a good one. It has a primary response. Its primary responsibility is formulating policies on population, refugees, and migration. And for administering United States refugee assistance and admissions programs formed in 1993, $1 billion budget, 120 employees. Excellent. And that's as of, uh, these are old numbers, 2005. Oh, yeah. That's got to be through the roof. Yeah. Yeah. This just I mean, I never ends. On and on and on and on. Nothing we can cut. But this is, I think, this is why leftists believe that we need the government to do so many things because it already does so many things. Yeah. And they think number one that all these things need to be done, and number two, without the government, nobody would do them. 
And the argument is just like, well, if these things are absolutely necessary, somebody will do them. In 2009, the Department of State was the fourth most desired employer for undergraduates, according to Business Week. The department? Really? Yes. Huh. They have a blog. No, of course they do. I wonder if a lot of it's idealized stuff because all the ambassadors are run out of the State Department. So, I mean, being an ambassador wouldn't be necessarily a bad gig. No. Depending on which country they sent you to. And you don't have to know anything. They just drop you there. I'm telling you, one of the most interesting books, it wasn't the best of his books. There's a guy named, I think his name's Eric Larson, that's written a series of um, historical nonfiction stories that are really entertaining, like not just boring, dry stuff. And he wrote one called In the Garden of the Beast, which was about our ambassador to Germany in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. This guy was a moron. Like an absolute idiot. No clue what the hell is going on, like right under his nose. Just well, lo- living it up, loving it, sure. hobnobbing. It's hobnobbing with the Russians and the Germans. Just having a gay old time. And it was funny because like nobody wanted that outpost. And really? I can't remember if he was a professor or something like that, but it was like his highest aspiration in life had always been to be an ambassador. And and the you uh, we treated him like that we treated him. Our government treated him like a dum dum. Well, look at Caroline Kennedy. Uh huh. She the, uh, was I don't know if she still is the uh, ambassador to Japan. <laughs> I'll never forget Tracy Ullman had a short lived uh, maybe two or three season show on HBO where she did a series of characters. So she's really good at that. And one that she would continuously do was Ariana Huffington. Mm-hmm. And right after, this must have been like 2009 when this when the show was on, um, she did this sketch with Ariana Huffington just having a meltdown, <laughs> Get, pretending to be on the phone with Obama and like asking for the ambassadorship to Greece or something like that. <laughs> and saying like, oh, the Huffington Post did so much to get you. Uh, elected and like again, I have my ambassadorship now. And nope, <laughs> nope, sorry. Just like anything else, it's who you know. Yeah. Well, and I can't remember who they ended up giving that to, but it was some other suck up. Probably someone related to Stephanopoulos. Oh, it's possible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anything else we want to talk about? Oh, I had a a new um I'm getting a little bit more liquor freedom in Pennsylvania. Oh. After last week and the wonderful news that during the DNC we're basically suspending all of our alcohol rules. Yeah. This is so ridiculous. And I don't even drink beer. So, this doesn't affect me in the least, but our wonderful governor, Mr. Tom Wolf, called for free the six pack. He wants beer to be sold at gas stations. And they're considering allowing this to happen. And I had read somewhere they might license nine gas stations. Wow. Well, you got to start this off slow, Tracy, to see how it affects the population. You have a bunch of people going in and filling up their tank and then, you know, buying a six pack and and drinking it in their car on the way home and getting in our accidents. And you have to stop the program. Well, you're joking, but that's what people were saying on Facebook. Of course. Because it came up in my Facebook feed, and it's not like I follow the governor. I don't care what he says, and I'm not really interested in him. And uh, But in my Facebook feed, there it was, my proud Democrat governor announcing that he's going to try to free the six-pack. And there were, I'm not kidding you, multiple comments in the thread being like, oh, great, Like we're just going to encourage drunk driving now. Like This is ridiculous. Like This is dangerous. And I was just sitting there thinking, like, oh, my God, have you guys never been to other states? Like, this is common practice in a lot of other states. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. When I was in New Orleans, we went through a drive through <laughs> Fat Tuesday where they gave us 32-ounce pina coladas out the window while we were sitting in the car. But, you, of course, you didn't drink them until you got back to your house, right? Correct. Well, I was riding shotgun, so oh. it wasn't a big deal for me. Yeah. But no, no, no. But it's just it's just a silly thing. Like, this is why I worry about people not being able to critically think about things. It's just like, oh, now because it's at a gas station, all of a sudden people are going to be drinking and driving. But, but they tra- wouldn't. Listen, Tracy, people really shouldn't have more access to alcohol. It's not good for them. 
<laughs> well, I mean, that's part of the argument. Of course it is. I, I that's what that's part of the argument here. When you when you stand up and say, "Listen, it's absolute bullshit that in Indiana I cannot buy packaged liquor on a Sunday." It doesn't take very long for someone to say, oh, do you really need, you can't go one day without buying alcohol? Is there something wrong with you? No, there's nothing wrong with me. It's none of the government's business when I'm buying alcohol. Absolutely. This is just about control. And I mean, the silly things are in states, like when I lived in Portland, you could buy wine and beer at at um, convenience stores and gas stations and stuff like that. But they stopped selling it. I can't remember if it was like at 2 or 3 mm-hmm. in the morning, but then you could start buying it again at 6 or 7. And it was just like so bizarre to me. Just like we had this blank out of four hours or whatever in the middle of the night that you can't buy it. But 6 a.m., baby, you'd absolutely need that. So there were like several times that I was working on um, films where we were shooting overnight. Mm-hmm. She would shoot from like sundown to sunup. So you come in at six and you're leaving at six or whatever. And I remember one time we were driving home and you're just getting off from work. You know, we're not on a normal people's schedule. And so we had to sit in the parking lot at the beer at the convenience store to wait until it was all of a sudden legal miraculously. And I can't remember if it was six or seven. I want to say maybe seven a.m. to get alcohol. And we waited just sitting behind that counter and they can't ring you up and we you know you try to negotiate with them you're like look it's 6 (laughs) 55 do we need to stand here for five minutes how about i do this how about i just give you a 20 it's only 18 dollars, and you ring up the sale as soon as it becomes legal and you keep the change nope can't do it can't do it can't do it and one of the funniest things that happened was um we, we did this one morning on the way home and one of the chicks that we were with, when you get bored and you're sitting around because there's a lot of sit around time, you like to do fun things, especially when you're friends with the effects makeup department. So one of the chicks that we were with had had one of the other girls give her a fake black eye. And we totally forgot about this because we're used to seeing this for the last 12 hours that she's got a fake black eye and she goes into the store to buy booze. <laughs> <laughs> at 7.15 in the morning. Uh. The next thing you know, the cops are there being like, are you a battered woman? <laughs> just, just pull out Kleenex and just like wipe the stuff off her face. <laughs> no, officer, we're just alcoholics that just finished work. That's all. Nobody beat us and sent us to the store to buy booze. <laughs> Thank you for your concern. though. <laughs> oh, my God. What a world. I know. Getting a little bit of booze freedom, though. That's good. I guess. Unfortunately, you don't drink beer. No, it's not. They're not going to put the wine in the stores. I guess that would be too much to ask. Uh, I went out with. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Got you. Go. I went out with some friends on Saturday night, and I was um. Oh, about. I'd say twenty miles from home. So I mean, usually I like to drink bourbon. I was like, well, we're going to be here for a while. I'm going to just get some beers. And I um, had some beers with them. And then on my way home, I didn't feel like going home yet. So I stopped at this other bar. It was closer to my house. And I kept drinking beer. And I used to really enjoy a, a you know, like a, a stout or a porter. And I still do. It's still, you know, they still taste great. But I'm telling you what, I can, I can drink jack daniels all night long and not wake up with a hangover i by the time i got done at that bar i'd been drinking beer for about seven hours and then at that point i got an uber home Mm -hmm. oh i felt like shit the next day just can't do it anymore can't drink beer that's why i quit drinking beer the last time i had one was in 2005 and i had a headache for three days yeah like it's not worth it bourbon doesn't do it to me but man beer sure does it's just, and you get so full, especially if you're drinking the heavier stuff. Yeah. It's, you feel gross. You know, I joke around a lot about how much I drink. And whenever I go to a conference, I, you know, it's out of control. But yeah. at home, I don't really drink. And I it amazes me how people, um, you know, my brother-in-law, he's not an alcoholic, but you know, he'll say, oh, yeah, you know, I get home from work and I'll throw some 
chicken or steak on the grill and you know have two or three beers it's like geez, that just doesn't appeal to me to have two or three beers at night after you get out of work yeah, I'm not the a casual drinker. Yeah. There are very few times in my life where I'm like, I've had a glass of wine or two. If I'm having one, I'm having a bottle. Yeah. So that's why I don't do it very often. You know who likes wine? Who? Ash Gow. Oh, yeah. I saw her tweeting about that. <laughs> it's like wine day or something. Yeah. But, you know, Ash Gow will be here next. And then we've got... Fox News is Ben Kissel. We can call him officially Fox News is Ben Kissel, right? I mean, he's an employee of Fox News now. Is he? Did you have to go through the Fox people? No, I didn't for him. But doesn't he? Isn't he officially? He announced he's a writer for Red Eye, right? Yeah, I believe that's true. So he'll be on after after Ash with Ash kicking. Excellent. Should we go to him? I think we should. Okay, we'll be back with Ash right after this. Ash Scow of the Washington Examiner and New York Observer is here. Hello, Ash. Hello, Fingers, Tracy. Hello. How are you, pal? I'm doing well. Uh, the sun's finally out down here, so that's welcome. Yeah, I hear you guys have been getting a lot of rain in D.C. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I was born in Portland, Oregon, and I was really happy that I don't live there anymore because it is so wet and rainy and cold. And then that's what we were getting here in D.C. in the spring. And it was awful. awful. It was, like, obnoxious. You know who else rude is obnoxious? of the city, really. Speaking of obnoxious, mm. Marco Rubio. <laughs> <laughs> He's everywhere. <laughs> All of a sudden... It was like he he went away for a couple months and now he's like oh he's touring these uh, you know housing complexes and calling for federal investigations into the way that people are being treated who live there. He's um, you know defending people on Twitter. He's you know defending people from Donald Trump. He's tweeting. He's you know running I don't know Senate panels. He's making speeches on the floor. He's doing all this stuff and but yet. He's apparently not doing anything beyond 20, he, 2017. He's not running for re-election. He's not really running for governor. He's not. He just says he's going to be a private citizen. But it's like well, yeah, you're being, you're in the spotlight so much all of a sudden, and these things aren't all connected. If they were all connected, it would be like, oh, he's just you know gearing up for this one bill. You know that's what Congress people do. Or, hey, I'm going to hold an event on this issue, and then I'm going to call for an investigation, and then I'm going to introduce a bill, and it's all related. But these are just things that are all over the place. So, you know, I think he's going to be, you know, at least with a lot of people in D.C., um, one of those politicians where people are always, is Rubio doing this? Is Rubio doing this? Just like Paul Ryan gets that. Like, how many times does Paul Ryan have to say he's not going to run for president, but there's still, like, a draft Ryan or what is this indicating he's going to run? Like I think a month or so ago, he had a Facebook ad up about donating to his campaign. And there was articles written about like, he's running a shadow campaign. And it's like, you know, people get reelected in the house every two years. Like he's running a reelection right now too. And it's just, maybe that's going to be the same thing for Rubio. Well, he still has a month, doesn't he? Uh, to jump back in and right. decide to run for the Senate again? Right. And so that's why, you know, I mean, I, I I always like to make fun of people who do the speculation and be like, you know, so you're telling me there's a chance every time they definitively <laughs> say no. But I was kind of thought it would be funny to write this article because people constantly do that. So it's like, let's maybe keep it going with Rubio or like, let's just see how many candidates we can have people constantly speculating about. I mean, right now we've got Paul Ryan. We always have Mitt Romney. You know, if we could get Rubio into the mix, let's, let's just see how many people. <laughs> well, is this kind of a ploy for him and he wants to be begged to stay in the Senate? Maybe. I mean, who wouldn't want to be, like, wined and dined for something, especially after your own state 
failed to vote for you. I mean, <laughs> maybe it would be nice to, to find out that there's some people in Florida that love you. That's where I'm leaning. And after all this, he's like putting forth a massive effort after we found out in the course of the campaign that he hates being a senator. And right, all exactly. of a sudden it's like, you, oh, this is a fun job. I can do stuff. Look at me. Yeah, you don't want to do your job. You barely vote. Uh, and then oh, now all of a sudden he's he's been there for like 100 percent of the vote since he dropped out of the presidential race. It's like if you hated being a senator before, wouldn't you hate it more after you've dropped out of a presidential race and you've only got like seven to nine months left in your term. Like that's, that's when I would hate it the most, you know, that like back in college and high school, you had the, what was it? Senioritis or whatever. I mean, this is like the last year of being a Senator. Like wouldn't he kind of have senioritis? You'd think, but maybe he's just doing all the things that he always wanted to do. And he's not letting the office slow him down from doing actual good work. Why now? I mean, yeah, like, I if don't he know. had been doing this stuff, <laughs> if he had been doing this stuff right. before he ran for president, and like while he ran for president, even then, maybe people wouldn't be able to argue that, like, why are we going to vote you in to be president when you're not doing anything as a senator to show us that you would do anything as a president? Yeah, that makes me think this is really calculated, that he saw some internals or something that said, hey, people think you're lazy and you haven't done anything. <laughs> and you pretty much but said... If you're going to be a, but again, if you're going to be a private citizen, why does it matter? Oh. I don't know. Maybe he's showing off for some decent think tank gig. Look, 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 right. guys, like I can this... work. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like there has to be a reason behind it. Yes. You don't just, like, suddenly... Oh, let me like fix things or, or do something on my way out when I don't when I claim I don't want to do anything after I get out. <sighs> well, we'll keep on the speculation case because we love that. That's right. Oh, I love it. Anytime that I can tweet out. So you're telling me there's a chance with a picture from Dumb and Dumber. I'm happy. <laughs> well, well, like you said, he's got till June 24th to make a decision. Yeah. So. We've got a month. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. um, you wrote a piece regarding hate crime hoaxers and, of course, the um, the latest hoax being the Whole Foods Market case down in Texas where a, um, a reverend claimed that he got a <clears throat> message on his cake that, uh, what was it? Uh, Love wins fag. Yes, yep. that's what it was. And, of course, he made the whole thing up. And Whole Foods was able to prove that. And yet, other than a little bit of public embarrassment, there doesn't seem to be any consequences for for people who come up with a uh, hate crime hoax. You think they should be prosecuted? I think so. It's it's you're you're defaming somebody. You're defaming a person, a company, somebody's reputation. You are doing harm to them. I mean, Whole Foods dropped their lawsuit against the guy when he dropped his against them. But Whole Foods should have kept going. Whole Foods should have sent a message because what if he had done this to a smaller grocer? Or what if now somebody gets the idea to do this at a smaller grocer who can't, you know, your neighborhood shop, especially if they find out that maybe those people, the owners go to church, right? And they do this to them and they can't afford um, mm -hmm. to file a lawsuit or defend themselves like Whole Foods does. Like this just opened it up for somebody else to go and do this to someone else. And we've seen it over and over again, where it's anytime a waiter or waitress comes up and says, look at this lousy tip I was left, or no tip, because someone is religious and uh, they thought I was gay or they don't like my religion or blah, 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 right? And those always end up being hoaxes. Same thing on college campuses, where anytime like you just had the the banana gate or whatever, right? Where the bananas were hung. And, you know, now there it really, really seems like the perpetrators were African American because there haven't been any sanction even though the school claims to know who did it. Now, if they knew who did it and it was a white student, like, yeah, that student would be expelled. But if it were an African American student, then you would expect the school to just be like yeah, we know who did it, and then nothing else, and then just hope it goes away, because that's what happened on other schools. When it's been proven that it was African-Americans, the very people who claim to have found 
the racist um, messages are the ones that actually put them up. I think there was an incident recently at a college where a woman, I think she was African American or, or Muslim, and she had one of those like whiteboards on her door of her dorm. And she claimed she came back and somebody had written like Trump 2016 on it or something and that it was very clearly aimed at her because uh, I think she was Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, you know, it turns out that it had been written over like a long like vacation. So nobody was really there. And um, it was like her handwriting. <laughs> You know, or, or there, there was, like, another instance where, like, security footage, like, found that it was the, stu the complaining student who wrote it. But it was like, oh, well, we just wanted to start a dialogue. And then it's okay. And then they don't get prosecuted. When, like, if a student had actually done that out of racism, bigotry, or, or whatever, then they would have probably been expelled from school and certainly had a mob after them and their safety threatened. So... I don't know why it is completely okay to mine, you know, essentially at this point, straight white people or who gets maligned by this because they're claiming it's racism and bigotry. So it's like, it's completely okay to malign these people and make them look racist. But, you know, like, I mean, like, I just don't understand how it's acceptable. Well, we reward the victim culture. So that seems to me like where this came right. from. And this started years ago. I mean, I, I want you to tell me with banana cases. So don't forget about don't forget that because I, I haven't heard of that. But the one that I remember, I mean, there's always been like anytime that there's a shooter, it's always immediately being like, oh, it's some right wing nut job from the guy right. that hung himself in the woods. Do you remember this years ago? I mean, it might even been 2009. He has like a U.S. census worker. And he like carved oh, yeah, something into his chest that said like the feds or something like that. And they were like, oh, my God, it's like the anti-government militia people did this. And like, meanwhile, he did it to himself. Then, you know, there's a series of like different lesbians that like put stuff all over their house, like spray paint themselves. And to that chick that punched herself in the face. Right. <laughs> Recently. Or, or the, the men who say they had things carved into them. I think there was the woman. Remember during, like, the Obama's election said she got beat up and had, like, something carved into her face, and it was, like, it was backwards, so she had clearly done it in a mirror? Oh, God. Oh, and there or, was a chick yeah, that, was she was, the one that lit herself on fire, too? Because there was one of those. Maybe. I don't know. But there was also, you know, there was, like, the gay man who wrote, like, bag on his arms, and again, it was, like, written clearly from his right hand onto his left arm so it could be legible. Like, it was just... Like, they're, they're so obvious in these things, and, like, people just let him get away with it because it's like, oh, they're obviously trouble. Well, if somebody who had actually, had actually, like, beaten them up and written something like that, that person's pretty troubled, too, and they're going to jail. Sure. Because what they did was a crime. And a hoax, I mean, filing a false rep uh, police report is a hoax mm -hmm. or is a crime, and yet mm -hmm. people don't get prosecuted. They just get let go because they're troubled. When, like, I mean, a lot of these hoaxes, they just go to the, straight to the media. They don't go to the police because they don't have to. They can get all the attention they want without committing an actual, actual crime, and then they don't face any punishment when they should. Now, what's this banana case? Uh, it was a school, I think it was down south. It was, like, Black History Month, I believe. There was a sign... Maybe it was promoting Black Lives Matter. I forgot the exact details, but somebody hung bananas from a sign that, like, the Black Student Union had put up or something. And, and people assumed that it was a racist thing. And, um, you know, obviously it was treated, you know, all over the media as, like, racism. And this is, and there, and there were the protests and the Black Lives Matter got involved. And this is so, so, such a racist campus and blah, blah, blah. And the school figured out who it was, like, really early on, and no one's, like, been expelled, which is why, and no one, you know, requested protection, which is why it, it's kind of believable that it was actually an African-American student who did it. Mm. Now, help me out. There's been some names floating. Help me mm -hmm. out here, Ash, because I'm trying to figure out why these stories um, always blow up without the media doing any kind of real digging. Is it because most journalists are lazy? 
or is it that they're so set in their ways on pushing a narrative that they really don't care if the facts jive with the story? So, because if you notice, when these things fall apart, it's only the right-leaning media that actually reports them. The places that reported them extensively, like the mainstream media that have this whites are narrative or racist and America is a racist country narrative, they might have like a little story about it being a hoax on like a buried somewhere in the paper or on the website, right? Whereas the actual host, hoax will be like front page news. But once it's discovered as a hoax, that's buried, never talked about. Well, and you see how much attention it gets. So, I mean, the Rolling Stone case, which we still haven't stopped talking about, what is it, a year and a half, almost mm-hmm. two years later? And that yeah. shows you that that was a case of wanting to fulfill a narrative. And you think these people would have learned after the Duke lacrosse case to be a little bit no, more No, absolutely dubious. not. Right. And they haven't even learned since Rolling Stone. Can't tell you how many articles that I read that are just the, just the accuser's story without any attempts to contact the accused or even, you know, consider that maybe it wasn't as serious a, as offense as being claimed. And sometimes the stories, they're putting it from a sympathetic view from the accuser, and their story doesn't even, like, add up to being serious. <laughs> well, I wonder if we're about to see a shift, a major shift on this, considering that what we just found out about Peter Thiel bankrolling the the lawsuit that Hulk Hogan had against Gawker. And if that's going to unleash a new wave of people that maybe it is little defendants like the mom and pop you were talking about that get caught up in one of these things. And then you're going to have people that actually have money that are sick of this stuff going on just saying, you know what, we'll help you. We'll pay for your lawyers. Go sue them for defamation. You know, it's make it a civil case and not bring in the the law, not bring the law into it and just say, no, 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 you destroyed my reputation and we're going to sue you and put this stuff down once and for all. That might have to be the case. I mean, you had the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education offering to pay the legal bills of a student Mm -hmm. or university who wanted to sue the federal government. And then the week after they asked that, uh, two uh, students, I believe, went and did sue the federal government, not under fire. And then there was also a Georgia congressman who filed a lawsuit against the federal government over the Education Department's Title IX overreach that's leading to all the sexual harassment and, and sexual assault and evisceration of due process issues going on on college campuses. So, you know, I mean, I don't know how those people are are bankrolling uh, them, but as you said, I mean, for smaller people, like I think the Oregon bakers that are being Mm -hmm. fined like hundreds of thousands of dollars because they didn't want to bake a wedding cake, I mean, for people like that, if somebody wants to bankroll, you know, their defense or something like that, I mean, at some point, a message just has to be sent that you can't, you can't just keep doing these hoaxes. They don't start a dialogue. They shut no. <laughs> down a dialogue because people don't believe anyone after that. Right, but they don't seem to be able to get that message either. Like, this isn't helpful. Right, because they just keep pushing this listen and believe. The more hoaxes that come out, the more you're supposed to listen and believe. When it's the exact opposite is what we take from right. it. Right. Exactly. Because if somebody is lying, then you can't assume everybody's telling the truth. No, it's sick. So I think that the combination of learning that about Hulk being bankrolled behind the scenes and the ongoing case right now with Rolling Stone and UVA and all that stuff, maybe we're sitting at a point of change in how this is all going to play out going forward. Because I can't imagine I this like game to. could continue. Yeah. I know. <laughs> but, I mean, the, the activists don't even engage with anyone who disagrees with them. And they have such a lockdown on the media and the, the um, Congress that, and the lawmakers that the other side, the side of reason and due process and common sense doesn't get heard. And they just shut it out and they don't engage. So there's a new story out. There's a college student who's actually a Bernie supporter who, you know, doesn't buy the one in five women being raped myth (sighs) and, you know, a bunch of the other statistics. And so he sent out 50 to 100 emails, I think, at this point, trying to talk to, trying to get any of the feminist professors, the activist groups on campus, activist groups 
nationally, uh, feminist groups nationally, uh, domestic violence, you know, anybody, anybody that is on, you know, the maiden side of this issue to debate him on it. And they just flat out refused, weren't responding. The one group that came closest, there was like, um, quote unquote, scheduling conflict. And most would be like, when they found out that they would actually have to like defend the one in five statistic, they'd like drop out. Like these, you don't even want to debate because if you debate, then you acknowledge there's another side. And if you acknowledge there's another side, then maybe you're wrong and they can't be wrong. And that stat has been around since what, the nineties? Well, there's like something from the eighties where it was one in four and now Mm -hmm. it's like one in five. And sometimes they say one in four, sometimes it's one in five, but regardless, it's, um, bunk. Uh, yeah, and we all know this. <laughs> but yet it's repeated. Right. It comes out of the mouth of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and I'm sure your favorite senator Joe Biden. Like Jill and Brand. Jill and Brand, like, that's like, I mean, she took it off her website, though, at one point. She knows it's a bogus. Sure. But she's going to repeat it, but she won't have it up on her website in print. <laughs> And speaking of, has Hillary Clinton accepted your challenge, Ash? Of course not. <laughs> I think, like, the day that article posted, she was out talking about the, the myth of the wage gap being due to discrimination. So I was like, yeah, she clearly didn't get my challenge. Well, I, but she's, I'm reading that Emily's List is telling her to stop this women card stuff. Yeah, at least with the whole first stuff. So maybe I didn't need my challenge, but... It's, you know, there are some people that tried to make fun of me for for doing that or or chastise me for doing that. But it's like, hey, look, I was right. All right. Emily's list told her Mm -hmm. that she needed to to chill on this because voters, turns out, don't like being talked to as if they're morons. What a weird concept. Her own supporters, she's treating like morons by constantly telling them. That she's a woman and going to be the and could be the first woman president, as if they would forget every five seconds. <laughs> oh, now what do you think of the fact that she's dodging Bernie and refuses to debate him before the California primary? Uh, I think <laughs> she doesn't believe he has a chance anymore, and he really doesn't. But right, right, she's moving on to the general. But I also, when it comes to the whole debating thing. I think she might be setting the stage to avoid Mm -hmm. debates with Donald Trump because she's claiming that like she doesn't like Bernie's tone. Right. Mm -hmm. And which is should be embarrassing to a presidential candidate. That's like, well, you mean to me. I don't want to talk to him. Right. But I feel like she's going to use that when it comes time to debate Donald Trump, which everybody in America wants to see. And every news outlet wants to run because of the ratings. But I think she's going to try and refuse because He's mean and he's got a bad tone. And it's just, really? You think Putin's going to be all nice to you? You think other world leaders are going to be nice? You think ISIS is going to be nice and polite to you? No, they want to kill you. They want to ruin America. Like, you're not going to be able to just say, oh, I'm not meaning with them because they're mean. Right. Like, that's, right. that's not presidential. No. No, and I've been saying this since she started that Bernie stuff. That was when he wanted to debate her in New York. And there was some flap that week, and I can't remember what it was that set it off. It was, I think it was when he finally took the gloves off and kind of went after her for the first time. Yeah. And that's when she it's started like we have with a the... Presidential, we have mm-hmm. a presidential candidate that needs a safe space. Like, that, that should be embarrassing. Yeah. Well, I, I wonder how distorted their view is of what the general population thinks, because they are looking at what the news is reporting on. They probably see the first round of these hoaxes and then not the retractions or the corrections because there might not be any. So I think that they no played this no, hand. There's yeah. no excuse because Hillary Clinton tweeted out that there is no excuse for racism on a college campus when the U Albany story broke. And there you I can't you cannot tell me that of the thousands, probably millions of tweets that she has received in response of that being a hoax, that she does not know, that her people do not know. And she has never issued a tweet that says there's no excuse for hoaxes or an apology for rushing to conclusions. Nothing. They know these stories are hoaxes. They just hope they can get away with it. Well, and they've been able to thus far. Yeah. And they just lie and they just lie and they just, I mean, that's Clinton 101. 
And now, you yeah. know, there's new revelations in the email thing, which I don't know that you've written about, but I saw you tweeting about it, so I know you're up to date no, on it. No, we've got our, our Sarah Westwood's uh, amazing on that. I don't know, like, her entire job is, like, Hillary <laughs> Clinton's email, that poor woman. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, the what is it, the federal investigation saying that she, she broke federal regulations. Yeah, the IG. It's the IG report. And then they stonewalled. She wouldn't be interviewed by them. She, did you hear that she hasn't granted one interview to the Washington Post? The Washington Post. Bezos like, outfit. That's part of the vast right wing conspiracy. <laughs> that's so funny. Because what was it last week or two weeks ago that, that Jeff Bezos came out and said, I'm putting 20 reporters on Trump oppo. Yeah. As if that's even that necessary. Maybe that was like he wrote a letter being like, look what I'll do for you, please. Let us interview you. <laughs> oh, it's so much fun. The DNC is going to be such a hoot. Yeah. Uh, well, is there Are anything else going to be going to that one? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I mean, it is in Philly, so it's only about 20, 25 minutes from me. I just don't know. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I keep sending finger stuff because I'm like, here's a new group that's popped up, and I don't know if you saw it. I think Truth Revolt had the story the other day that there's an Occupy the DNC movement, and they've taken... <laughs> it's a pretty awesome. But they're really good at graphics. Like, I'll always give that to the left. And they took Bernie's face and made it into the Guy Fox mask shape. Oh, so it's, it's a bunch of Bernie bros that are going to occupy the DNC. And then you've got Black Lives Matter is going to be there, La Raza, the Eco Nuts. I mean, it's going to be outstanding. I'm sure there'll be a big feminazi contingent there. Yeah, and, I wonder just how many rapes and oh God. fights and arsons are going to be happen here. Well, those are just protests. They're not riots or anything like that. Oh, they're like, peaceful. What? They're so peaceful. Right. When I saw the police horses getting attacked last night in New Mexico, I thought about you because I figured that would just put you. I was thinking about that today. That was just like the horses, the horses, people. Yeah. You can't sit there and look like peaceful people. And then today, also, the Trump supporter who's in a wheelchair got assaulted. And it's like you are the people that the media favors. Like, yeah, this is insane. They're attacking horses and disabled people and the media is standing behind them. Yes, and saying that Trump is going to bring hatred. Yeah. It, it's truly stunning. And I do think they would have done this regardless of who was at the top of the Republican ticket. You would have seen this stuff going on. And uh, Oh, absolutely. It, it's amazing. It's truly disgusting. And I, I have to imagine that every time that stuff happens, that Trump's just getting more votes. Because people are sick of this stuff going on. Yeah. And, and sick of watching it. it being cheerleaded. And saying, right. oh, these people have a legitimate grievance. Oh, they do? A grievance that's good enough to, like, push right. a horse over? Yeah. So you don't like things that Trump says. His words. So you physically attack people and animals. Like, that's not, that's, that's, that's no, that's not acceptable. You don't really respond to words with violence. But see, this is where the left has so bastardized the re reality itself, where they say, well, words are violence, so we're just responding. This is self-defense. Right, exactly. That's, uh, I mean, they've been trying to push that for a few years now in order to justify their criminal actions. Yeah. And we then you get the campus okay. crazies going off last night, too. I'm sure mm -hmm. you saw that at DePaul. I mean, my The God. woman that just hit Milo in the face. And the police did nothing, and I'm certain nothing's going to actually happen to her. Well, but she didn't like, hit him. On she camera, got just, she's walking up to him, like, knocking him in the oh. face. She put, I think she pushed him, because I watched it. I don't know if she actually hit him. She, I mean, she got up it in wasn't his face. Like a, no. It wasn't a heart, it wasn't like a punch or anything, but she got up and, like, did something right in his face. And she that was like, ripped a microphone Milo out of the guy's hands. Because Milo wasn't going to do anything. But imagine if someone had did that to her. She would have been all about, my life was in danger. I was a, could have been punched. That's what I thought was going to happen. Oh, absolutely. No, it's vile. It's absolutely disgusting. And I bet you see what you saw at Mizzou happen to DePaul now, that people aren't going to send their kids there. 
And if I was going mm-hmm. to school there, I would be leaving. It's not a cheap school. Well, did you see what the university president did? He said he was ashamed of the protesters, but he spent the first half of his letter talking about oh, how he disagrees with Milo and thinks Milo, Milo is vile and blah, blah, blah. And he was he, the first thing he mentioned was the gender wage gap, claiming that uh, <laughs> stats show that he's right. It's like, no. Stats absolutely, without a doubt, prove that the people pushing the gender wage gap are liars. Right, right. But see, this is the words are equal violence nonsense that they've all internalized and they believe. I mean, watching that behavior was truly stunning. I could not believe it. And the fact that Milo could stay so calm through the whole thing is really commendable as far as I'm concerned. Because I kept thinking, oh, my God, what would I be doing if I was sitting up there? I don't know if I get to just sat there right. and let them look like fools like that. Right. But he handled it yeah, really, really well. I would well. have thought he would have engaged, and he was pretty good about just being silent and letting them go. Mm-hmm. And I think, in retrospect, I think that was the right thing to do. Right, to just let them look like idiots. Yes. But now they get to claim, because they've been named and they've been their faces have been shown, they're going to claim, look at all the hate I'm getting, and oh my god, I'm a victim. And it's like, <laughs> like, you don't get to do something like that and then pretend you shouldn't have had any consequences and play the victim card when you went up to hurt somebody. Right. And disrupt an event where 500 plus people were sitting there enjoying themselves. Mm-hmm. They had paid. And then I can't play the victim this- when people yeah. get mad. Right. Right. When you're trying to incite stuff. I mean, they were up in his face. And he he just grabbed the microphone Mm -hmm. from a student. Yeah. Well, I was impressed with it out of his hand. He was really good, too. And I couldn't believe his balls because by the end of it, he got up back on the microphone and started like cursing out the administration and the security guards that they had been forced to pay to provide and pay for themselves. that didn't do anything like wow, this kid is nothing. They sat there. That kid totally is risking expulsion by doing that. So good for yeah. them. I think that this campus craziness is coming to an end. I hope the hoaxes are coming to an end. No, the be- hoaxes have been going on for years. And look yeah. at the attention they get. That's all yeah. these people want, media attention. They're showing footage from Albuquerque last night of these animals just throwing rocks at people. Hmm. The Trump trains like, come from monsters. all over Ash. <laughs> That's what I have to wonder. It's like, what happens if Trump wins? Is this stuff going to get shut down or is it going to ratchet up for a while? What is this going to look right. like? Right. Well, they're probably going to get more violent and they're just going to say, oh, it's totally justified because Trump said this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I don't think there's a positive outcome to all of this in the end. I just think it's going to get worse and worse, and I don't know what stops it. Which is why you should invest in gold. <laughs> Wait, why Diversify is the police your portfolio, just... Ash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because when the system And then the protesters are getting mad that the police are, are pepper spraying people. Suddenly they're, no, we're victims, and they're just throwing rocks at the cops. Mm-hmm. These people just don't, it's like they don't think they should have any consequences for their actions. I should be able to throw rocks at cops and nothing bad should happen to me. They should just take it. Yeah. I should be able to initiate violence and not expect somebody to come after me in self-defense. Mm-hmm. And I hate having to... A flare at cops. Yeah. Right in their faces. No, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's it's worse than the Occupy guys. I mean, it's almost like the the WTO um, protests and the May Day protests just come to life. It's absolutely, insane. every day. Yeah, They're and we're only smoke bombs at cops and thinking that they shouldn't have any consequence and thinking they're 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 justified. They're in the right. Mm-hmm. They're the just. Yes, and they were worried months ago that the the Republican convention was going to turn out to be a crazy scene. Right. It's going to be fun to watch those two back to back because th- the Republicans is first, correct? Yeah. And I would imagine it's going to be fairly subdued unless they the left infiltrates, which I'm sure they'll do. But I think the, the DNC is going to be quite the shit show. Mm-hmm. So I hope Philly and Cops that'll still be blamed on the left. <laughs> or yeah. they'll still be blamed uh, on the right. Of course. They'll be like, the first 
time, any instance of violence, it's going to be like right wingers infiltrate the DNC and then have to have a quiet retraction. <laughs> I'm just looking forward to seeing like Debbie Wasserman Schultz burned in effigy. <laughs> If she makes it that far, (laughs) they've got to be churning out pinatas of her. I mean, I do appreciate like the Trump pinatas and I love that that's acceptable again. You know, Trump with Hitler mustaches and but watching the DNC. Yeah. Oh, I love that we've gone back to the days of effigies. I love that we're back there. Yes. It's fun. Descent is patriotic. Never forget that. Mm -hmm. Check out Ash's work. Over at the Washington Examiner and New York Observer, and you can follow Ash on Twitter, at Ash Scott. We'll talk to you next week. Talk to you then. Enough already! We're calling Ben Kissel. Hello. Hello, Ben. Hey, what's up, Fingers? How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you doing? I'm good. We just wrapped uh, Abe Lincoln's Hop Ad, so I'm going to talk in a mood. Nice. Oh, great. So what's the name of this new podcast? Enough Already. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, tell us about uh, what's been going on over at Abe Lincoln's Top Hat. Oh, so yeah, today we just talked about I, I uh, interviewed Gary Johnson on Friday, which was extremely fun. So we just talked about... Um, some of his policies. I disagreed with him on his pharmaceutical policy because he does not want the, gov- uh, the government to uh, regulate pharmaceutical, the industry whatsoever. But I think the industry is completely nefarious and destroying this country. So I would actually like to see the government do some regulation on big pharma. But In the form of what? Exactly. Uh, well, in the form of literally what we had to do with, uh, you know, Philip Morris and, uh, and big tobacco. I mean, they have to be held responsible for the unbelievable amount of deaths that their products are causing. And it's totally, um, you know, circular when it comes to the prison industrial complex. People are getting hooked on oxy and then they go to heroin and we have an AIDS epidemic in Indiana of all places. It's all because of these unregulated big pharmaceutical companies who are just making massive amounts of money uh, and throwing millions and millions of dollars uh, into, uh, you know, lobbying. And then doctors are getting the kickbacks. So it's, it's a terrible corrupt system. So that's the right. one thing that I disagree with Gary on. But you're missing the p- piece of that where the DEA approves how much oxy they're allowed to push. Yeah, and the FDA. I mean, they just they just yeah. recently allowed uh, 12-year-olds to get OxyContin. Yeah. I mean, it's insane. Right. Right. So so my thing is like, yeah, it's not just the pharmaceutical companies. They're being abetted by the government. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the government is like totally down with it. Yeah. Get rid of them. It's a massive problem. <laughs> yeah. That, well, I'm that's saying, my I mean, struggle with Gary as a libertarian. I'm like, dude, no. Throw everybody out of these agencies. They're worthless. Like, they've got 12-year-olds on heroin. No, but that, was, that, but that was the thing that Gary wouldn't do. I mean, he doesn't want to do um, anything when it comes to fixing the pharmaceutical problem. So I thought that was – because he's so into, like, you know, uh, you know small government, but it, com- it becomes, you know, a little bit more muddled when there are – you know, be- because it is a plutocracy – uh, it becomes a lot more muddled when you have huge corporations that are destroying lives in the nation. Uh, I think the government should actually step in and, uh, and stop it. But that's just me. But my point is that they're already in it, and they're not stopping it. They're encouraging it. They would no, rather they're that they... exactly. Yeah, yeah. So how do you get them to it's stop the policy change. they're encouraging? Okay. Yeah, they would just have to change policy with it. I mean, I'm, what I'm saying is that Gary would just leave it as is. I see what you're saying. But what's the policy change? What's the Ben Kissel band-aid that solves this? Boo boo. I mean, I think we, you have to, we have to straight up allow um, uh, for people who are victims of pharmaceutical abuse uh, to sue the companies and allow them to do exactly what we did with big tobacco and, uh, and bankrupt them slowly through that. We have to do what they did in Florida where they arrested, I think it was 50 doctors um, who were doing massive kickbacks for Oxy. They were just like throwing it at people who came in because they were crying slightly because a girlfriend broke up with them or something. And they were just giving them tons and tons of prescription drugs. So um, I think we have to start, um, you know, punishing these people as criminals. All right. Because it's, it's, I mean, why, why, is it, why is a drug dealer in Chicago getting 25, uh, you know, 15 to 25 years for selling, uh, you know, a, uh, a cocaine, and, and, and which is not nearly as addictive as these pharmaceutical um, pills that are just being shoveled down people's throats? 
It doesn't make any sense. No. I agree with you on that point. That the way I would fix it is a little bit different, but that's fine. How would you fix it? Legalize When do we start the podcast, by the way? <laughs> We're already oh, in legalize. it, baby. <laughs> yeah. Oh, are we in it? Yeah. yeah, just decriminalize all the drugs. I think that's the easiest way to do it. Not that that's, you know, overnight fix is possible. Well, you yeah, I mean, change a whole lot of minds, but stop well, yeah, I mean, we can, allowing I mean, the government the monopoly on selling drugs, selling heroin. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, or, if you decriminalize all the drugs, which I'm not necessarily completely against, um, mm-hmm. but like, how would, how would that solve the pharmaceutical problem? Well, it solves it because people are going to buy heroin instead. Or you can just get your Oxycontin over the thing. It's not going to necessarily solve this problem, but it takes power away from people that are benefiting off of it, right? And now we're not throwing people in jail for selling cocaine, like you were just saying, as opposed to doctors who are just giving 12-year-olds heroin. But because it comes in pill form and it's approved by the FDA and the DEA and the right. you know, all those regulatory agencies, it doesn't seem as nefarious. If you just demystify this whole drug culture, I think it would help all tremendously. Yeah, but I mean, it's not really about that because that, that would not harm the pharmaceutical industry whatsoever. If you decriminalized heroin, it would just leave people, uh, it wouldn't, uh, you know, put people in prison, which, is, which I think is a good thing. But if anything, it would incentivize them more to sell Oxycontin, right? I mean, they're just in the opiate game. Mm-hmm. So if you, I mean, so what would be the, what would be pharmaceutical, big pharma? I'm just saying, I, I think that pharmaceutical industries need to realize that they have massive amounts of blood on their hands. And even if the people do not go on to harder drugs, if they die, they owe, I mean, I have a friend, Ed Larson, who's around table of gentlemen who lost five friends to Oxy in Florida. I mean, granted, it's Florida. So everyone is looking for something to do. Right, but, right. you know, um, it, it's very interesting that, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies just get away with everything uh, with, with no one even batting an eye. And I think it's really, it's a problem. So well, I you also even, don't uh, so see, like, a massive campaign to say, like, hey, these are dangerous, like they did with smoking, where the government had this huge, right. you know, we learned in school from the time we were, what, kindergarten maybe? Like, cigarettes are going to kill you. Don't ever go near them. And you don't see that kind of, yeah. that's what I'm saying, that's something else that could be done. Well, I mean, how could Oxycontin really be bad for you? After all, a doctor prescribes it for you, so it's got to <laughs> right. be okay. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's the problem. People you look at a script and they're like, oh, yeah, it's perfect. It's got, it's got you know, some doctor's name on it, and they think it's absolutely wonderful. And smoking, you know, Nicolas Cage was doing it. How could it be bad? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but the other aspect of decriminalizing, Ben, is that you start introducing pot to people as an alternative pain relief. Which is how these people are getting addicted in the first place, right? They're going, they're getting, they have massive pain. And so what does the doctor do? Just over prescribes you all these opiates. And if they had an option and said and say, hey, you could just go pick up some pot. And then you don't have to go yeah, down this road. Agree. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I completely think it's, agree. I, mean, I don't think they're, I, I, I'm just saying, I don't think that they are, uh, that they're not really necessarily like mutually exclusive things. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that you have to have, um, you know, decriminalizing, uh, you know, recreational drug use, it, it doesn't mean that you can't punish pharmaceutical companies for what they've done to this society. I mean, they are destroying us. I think right. big pharma is the worst, is, is the worst uh, form uh, of, of corporate greed that exists because it is completely, it is only uh, profitable if you convince people that they're in dire need of something that they don't actually need, and then that thing that you convince them they need kills them. Mm. It's so bad. But anyway, it's exactly like big tobacco, I think. I can't stand uh, big pharma just because I can't watch a damn football game with my 12-year-old daughter without a damn Cialis commercial coming on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm like, this is why, you know, I mean, I, and I love Cialis commercials because I want to find love, you know? <laughs> but You want to anyway, win foot bathtubs on a beach someday? That's yeah, I mean, just mutually, ma- just, just sort of lonely masturbating, but holding the the hand of my spouse. I mean, that's not <laughs> stuff. <laughs> no, ben, we I have... apologize. I haven't eaten. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of eating, we 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 had Cat Timph on the show last yeah. week, and she um, mm-hmm. wanted us to have an intervention with you. 
for for a yeah. number of reasons. Good. Uh we'll uh, maybe we'll get to Neil Young in a little bit, but um, yeah, she, she, yeah, was, she told me <laughs> she, yeah, she's, <laughs> she's very uh, disturbed over the fact that you dip pretzels in mayonnaise. Oh, my God. You know, OK, Catherine is she is a known fibber. She is a violent <laughs> liar. Um, and first of all, OK, I do not dip pretzels in mayonnaise. I dip it in a salsa con queso. Maybe I dipped um, pretzels in salsa con queso then some salsa, and then some mayonnaise. But I don't exactly go around, uh, you know, just <laughs> dipping a bunch of carbs in liquid lard, okay? So she's out of her mind, and, you know, that's classic dip. So okay. let's, not, let's take it with a huge grain of salt. I, okay, I was, I was know, concerned sometimes. hearing this because I was picturing you with, like, uh, a pretzel rod in your hand, uh, and, and in your other hand, a Hellman's jar of mayonnaise, and you were dipping yeah. the pe- pretzel rod in the mayonnaise, and that's that's... Uh, I'm not a doctor, but I don't think that's good for you. Well, no, I mean, I, 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 you know, honestly, maybe I should start taking oxy because it stops your appetite. I, <laughs> what, what, Winnie the Pooh, he loved honey, uh, and I do love mayonnaise. I'm a good, you know, I'm just a, I'm just a very white German person, and, and mayonnaise is, uh, it's, just, it's just, you know, if you waste anything, it's a crime <laughs> against God. And I believe that Lord should be whipped up into a fluffer into a beautiful fluffy paste and occasionally be uh, penetrated by a pretzel. <laughs> well, Kat, I love mayonnaise. Cat seems to be highly entertained uh, watching you eat because uh, she also went on a five oh, she's minute just tangent. Jealous. She can't do it. <laughs> oh, she went on a five minute tangent that you eat your bagels plain, not toasted with uh, nothing on them. Yeah, but there's zero wrong. Okay. Oh my god. Okay. This is pathetic. So anyway, anyway, it's not a plain bagel, okay? It is. I get an onion bagel, maybe an everything bagel. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'll get, uh, you know, a, uh, a garlic one. And I dip the bagel in the cream cheese. I just don't like to smear the cream cheese because some bites I want a lot, some bites I want a little. And let's be honest, we're not living in communist China where every piece of the bagel has to have the same amount of cream cheese. It's pathetic. <laughs> so I, I get very upset with this uh, with this premise that Catherine is throwing out there that I don't exactly know how to carbo load because I will carbo load like the best of them <laughs> and with the best of them. So <laughs> she's nonsensical. The whole thing's a lie, and I always get my bag or hot sauce. I'll just put hot sauce in a bagel. I'll do anything with the bagel, but rarely do I eat them plain. But sometimes I do eat them plain. I'm on a pigeon's diet. <laughs> <laughs> That's how she described it, actually. But you carry hot sauce in your purse? <laughs> What's that? Do you carry hot sauce in your purse? No, I carry Hillary Clinton in my purse. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yes, I have a little Hillary. That's what I do. Like Anthony Hardaway had a had little, had little penny. I have a little Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing Very that she, she went off on a tangent about is apparently when you guys go out, uh, at, at the end of the night, you have to watch the same Neil Young documentary every time? Okay. Okay, so Catherine, <laughs> you know, she is, she, she's so lucky to hang out with me sometimes. Okay, so there's a great Neil Young documentary. It's called, I believe it's called Harvest Moon. Um, maybe it's called something else. I forget. But I have it in my house, and now it's also on Netflix. It's also on Netflix. So Google Neil or Netflix Neil Young, and it, it's a it's a it's a newer album. So he is very old, and he sings about losing his daughter because she went off to college. There's a lot of sweet empty nester songs, and I think that Neil is just the best. So you know, I don't know what she's complaining about. She loves listening to it, and everyone is super thrilled when they get to hang out with me because what's more hip and current than Neil Young. <laughs> oh, God. I, everyone should love Neil. I don't understand how we're living in a world where Neil Young is considered, you know, uh, cheesy to listen to. I mean, come on. He was the original grunge artist. <laughs> Whatever. So Catherine's wrong about all of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for she's, You know, she smoked an e-cigarette, so that's not yeah. good. She, yeah. You know. Anyway. Yeah. Well, so do I. That's why I hate the uh, the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, but you know, Kat started smoking an e-cig, but she never smoked cigarettes. I know. We're not That's supposed to talk about nuts. people that exist that do that. Okay? That's supposed to be okay. kept out of the stats. That's not okay. Well, I'm just yeah. saying. For everybody so. else. Yeah, yeah, they're ruining it for all of us. No, I don't really care. I applaud well, it. Come to the vape side. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Always go to the main. I mean, I don't know why, you know, whatever. Um, we're not going to talk about it. You guys are all going to get popcorn lung, and you're going to end up sounding like, you know. Did you? Oh, like please. Really? Do you know it's about disgusting. popcorn lung, Ben, or you bought that nonsense? Yeah. What, do you, what do you know about it? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh my, well, it, it, it's, it's good to have in a movie theater. I mean, what do you want me to know about it? I know that it's, it's sad. Uh-huh. And, and, and people, they cough a lot, and their lungs look like popcorn. <laughs> right, that's, that's not true. popcorn lung, and it's not caramel. No, it's called it's popcorn disgusting. lung because the people that first got it were working in, like, the Orville Redenbacher plant, breathing in fake butter all day. Yeah. Yeah. And because they were and they were making the great popcorn that I still eat to this day that <laughs> comes in a microwavable bag, because, I have to say, we did just get our gas shut off. So we'll be oh. eating a lot more popcorn. <laughs> You don't dip that in mayonnaise, do you? And good you? for them. What's that? No, you don't dip sauce. that in mayonnaise, do you? No, you have to pour it in mayonnaise and spoon it out. You can't dip popcorn with those fingers. <laughs> <laughs> what, what kind of maniac do you think I am? <laughs> good. Now you got me all riled up. <laughs> Lord. That's how we like it. <laughs> yeah. Pissed off. But no. Yeah. Yes. Catherine's doing very well, though. So that's good. Well, you're doing very well these days, too, right? You've joined the uh, Fox News. Family. Yeah, doing good. I mean, last podcast on the left, one of the podcasts I do was just number six on iTunes. That was good. We beat Mark Marin, which I think is wonderful because, oh, that's you know, excellent. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm so over it. It's like, <laughs> why more, you know, wealthy, middle-aged white person? I think you're fine, <laughs> but whatever. Oh, uh, he's you know, such you a wet diaper, that are, guy. He's such a what? A wet diaper. Oh, yeah, I'm just, what are you complaining about? He just, I mean, whatever. Um, so that's good. Working at Red Eye, which is going very well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, doing doing some on-camera stuff. I'm on hold right now for Kmart. I might be their next big and tall model. So that's how. No. <laughs> yeah. I got a call today from my management company or my agency. And um, they're like, yeah, you're on hold for Kmart. So. I'm you know, I'm working at Fox News. I might be uh, you know doing an ad campaign for Kmart, and you know I mean Golden Corral is next, <laughs> and I can't wait to talk about the Chocolate Fountain. I think the Chocolate Fountain is insanely wonderful, and everyone who is obese dipping their marshmallows in it have the right idea. <laughs> I used to. In love, no way is it disgusting. I used to love going to Kmart. They had one up in Michigan that you know back in the day Kmart used to have a cafeteria. And you could spin. Oh, really? Yeah, you could spin for a freaking Sunday. So it had like this little wheel with different prices on it, and you could win a Sunday for a, uh, a a penny. It was the best. Oh my god! They need to bring that back. That's remarkable. Be part of your ad campaign. Hey, you know what? If I get to be the spokesperson for Kmart, I'll make sure they get it back. As a matter of fact, I'll put a Golden Corral in a Kmart, and all it will play is Fox News <laughs> on the television. <laughs> It'll be big. That'll make yeah. America great again. That, that will. You know that Donald Trump just straight up stole that from Reagan. You know that? Oh. Yeah, Reagan's campaign in 1980 was "Let's Make America Great Again," and Trump just, just he got rid of the "Let's" and he just kept uh, "Make America Great Again." Oh, I thought you were saying that Trump stole the idea of putting a golden corral in a Kmart. <laughs> no, no. When Trump is president, I will give him that idea, and then I will become. You know, whatever, you know, uh, position that would require an office. I don't know what I would be like. Maybe like, you know, Department of Greasy Food or something. And then I will be the head of the Kmart in, uh, in the Golden Corral. It would be big. Yeah, well, Oversized you could get in. Shirts. And uh, you could design the new food pyramid, too, Ben. Because I know you've had issues with oh the food my God. pyramid. You know what? I'm so <laughs> over the use of a pyramid. Let's make it a square. It should be a food square. Mayonnaise, pretzels, bottom <laughs> ring. Top one. <laughs> Obviously, anything that is Golden Corral, and then the, and then the chocolate slowly drips down. So each each rung of the square does get a little chocolate because that's the whole point of a fountain. <laughs> and then in the middle, I mean, I don't even know, maybe Arby's roast beef or something. <laughs> it, it doesn't even sound that much worse than what the federal government no. had with the food pyramid, which caused right. the obesity epidemic we're currently living in. <laughs> well, you've got a couple really months to work on thing. this. You got a couple of months. Yeah, yeah, this, the, yeah, the, the food square. It'll be big. Yeah. Huge. I can't wait for Trump. Yeah, it'll be huge. 
Yeah, you seem to be one of the only other people around in like the media circle that's just sitting back and enjoying this instead of freaking out this entire election cycle. I love it. Burn it down. You know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> what, what, there's nothing to freak out about. You know, I just watched I, I, I watched uh, Obama's Vietnam speech last night. It was mm-hmm. pathetic on all levels. It was awful. He's so apologetic. He does not represent us well whatsoever overseas. He just constantly blames um, the, the people that he is supposedly uh, governing. He blames us for everything. And uh, so when Trump is president, you know, it's going to be the absolute opposite and uh, obnoxious for different reasons. But at least it'll be nice to have somebody uh, in office who just calls us the greatest thing since sliced bread dipped in mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I'm excited about that. Yeah, you I know, mean, I'm the so sanctimony. Sick. I'm so sick. Right. The sanctimony of Obama is pretty uh, amazing, like running around. And I think you made one of the best points on Kennedy's show about everybody flipped out when Trump said in that one debate that, he, you know, he was open to the idea of killing ter- the families of terrorists. And it took yeah. you going on Kennedy and being like, oh, hey, guys, Obama's doing this and he has been for years. Where's the outrage? Yeah. And he's got his Nobel Peace Prize uh, to, <laughs> to show for it because right. no one cares. I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I, I will say, I mean, I think Obama will go down as one of the top five presidents of all time, quite frankly. I think that's how history is going to reflect on, uh, on his presidency. I think he's going to leave office with roughly 60% approval rating. I mean, when W left, he left with around 30%, and Clinton had a similar amount uh, to what Obama's going to leave with. So I think he's going to be um, seen as, uh, as a not necessarily an effective president, but as a, as, a, um, as, a, as a good figurehead to some people. Uh, for the nation. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there is no more important person in an open seat election than the current president, and there is no more different person than Obama, uh, from Obama than Trump. So I think that's why he's doing so well, because people are sick of, um, of the professorial attitude that Obama has towards governance, and they really want, if I was Donald Trump and I had to, like, make fun of myself, if I had to do, if he had to pull, like, a, a lion Ted or a, um, mm-hmm. Or a, uh, a what was it? Tired, tired Jeb. What was Jeb's thing? Low, low energy. Did no energy. Low energy. Yeah, low. I would say emotional Donald. You know, Donald is pure emotion, and I think that's what people are being attracted to right now because we are in the wake of such an unbelievable. I mean, you know, some, some would argue stoic, I suppose, for Obama, but just very dry emotionally, and so that's why Trump is. Uh, people are really seeing him as a breath of fresh air. Because the most important person, again, is the sitting president, and there is no, uh, no greater rebound from Obama than Trump. So you think he's got it locked up, Trump? You know, I mean, this Clinton Foundation scandal is real. It's a huge yeah. scandal. You know, only, they only give 10% to the, uh, any charity whatsoever. And, I mean, what the, um, you know, getting money from the foreign government, specifically the Saudi government, which, so we have the, we have the heels of the... the the 9-11 report's going to come out, whatever, the 27 pages, something like that, which, which you know, is just going to uh, officially uh, lay out everything that we've already known that the Saudis caused 9-11. I mean, 15 out of the 19 hijackers, I mean, this is, this is not a, uh, this isn't a mathematical error or mm-hmm. just like a happenstance. And so the Clintons getting money from the Saudi government that, that has then, uh, uh, you know, forced them to pass, to pass certain policies while they were the Secretary of State, and then top that with Clinton's, uh, with Bill's, sex scandal that Donald is just going to like start railing on, I think that uh, it is going to be extremely difficult for, for her to, uh, to beat Trump. And, you know, I mean, these four polls in a row, Quinnipiac, which I don't know what Native American tribe that is, but they do some great polling, <laughs> um, uh, you know, showing, showing Trump win. I mean, that is, uh, that's no joke. So, you know, what people have done since the beginning of his candidacy, uh, they have laughed him off. Um, but I think he's going to laugh his way all the way to the White House. Are you surprised at all that the that the Clinton campaign hasn't had uh, an effective strategy dealing with with him? I cannot believe. I mean, he's so creative with these one liners. They have Hollywood. He's not even their... creative, <laughs> right? <laughs> they're just effective, I guess, is what you're trying to say, right? Uh, well, I mean, I just uh, off the top of his head, they're they're they're, they're cr- okay. No, they aren't the most cr- you know saying crooked Hillary, but as far as right. Politics goes, they're they're creative because there has been no creative uh, creativity in the Republican Party in in decades. But I, I'm mm-hmm. surprised that the, the the Clinton campaign hasn't been able to use Hollywood somebody there to, to help them. I mean, dangerous Donald. That's the best they could do. Sure. Yeah. 
And you know what? Dangerous is actually kind of a cool term. For yes. <laughs> you know, you kind of want a da- again, going back to the sitting president, I want, I want a dangerous maverick president. I want Nicholas Cage to take the office. You know, I mean, um, it's, uh, it, it's unbelievable. And, and, and their strategy right now of not engaging Trump, of allowing him to get all the attacks in that he possibly can, and they're trying to stay above the fray, that doesn't work. Okay, because right now we have somebody with the ball on offense. And if you just allow them to constantly score, you're going to end up losing the game. And these points matter. You know, so it is remarkable that you learn nothing from 2004 John Kerry's campaign. They call it swift voted for a reason. He just refused to acknowledge negative ads. It doesn't matter how preposterous the claim is against you. If you don't acknowledge it um, and, and, uh, and nullify it, it will fester and it will grow. So, I mean, the fact that they're not taking Trump on makes them look extremely scared, and Trump is going to throw, it, this is going to be the Jerry Springer of election. <laughs> uh, this is a Jerry Springer show. I mean, who is the daddy? That's more Povich, I understand. But this is, <laughs> this is the Klan, this is, this is the Klan meeting the Black Panthers on Christmas. This is huge. <laughs> you know, this is, this is, this is reality show gold. And, uh, and, and so for Hillary, for her campaign to come out and publicly say they're not going to respond to the attacks levied by Trump is a massive mistake that history has proven time and time again to be a death, uh, you know, a nail in the coffin for political campaigns. So I don't know what she's thinking. Well, she was what? able to get away with that with Bernie, but she's not going to be able to get away with it with Donald Trump. Hey, but has she been able to get away with it with Bernie? She has 3 million more votes than the guy. She's almost at 2,383, which she needs to clinch. And he is still winning the, the mm-hmm. war of narrative. Yeah. I mean, she hasn't, I will not say that she beat Bernie. Uh, you know, I mean, technically, but I mean, uh, uh, by, by so many measurements of, of uh, you know, of uh, just, you know, sociological measurements, just like looking at what society uh, what, what this nation thinks about when, you, when, when they hear Bernie Sanders' name compared to when they hear Hillary's name, her unfavorables are through the roof. People love Bernie. I think she lost the campaign against Bernie, even if she wins the nomination. It was a huge, huge blow to her entire campaign. I'm just saying it worked for, for her it, just because she's going to get the nomination. But no, you're, you're right. Um, it, p- part of the problem for her is she's just a horrible person. So it's it's hard to that is a problem. That it's hard to <laughs> have your favorability numbers go through the roof when you're not likable because you're a horrible person who hates being around other people. She's probably one of the worst politicians I've ever seen. I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, she. I I, I know. Uh, you know, my friend Christopher Hahn, who works with her very closely, he's a regular guest on Red Eye. I do his radio show a lot. He knows Hillary personally, and he swears. My friend Jessica Tarlov as well. They know her personally. They, they love her. They swear she's super engaging in, in, uh, in person. She's a policy-minded person, but it, she just does not have the it factor. At the end of the day, politics are theater, and she is not an actor. And, uh, and maybe she can benefit. Maybe she should start being like, hey, I know I suck on stage, but it's because I'm good in a boardroom or whatever it might be. But at this point, she just has not been able to get a foothold on any narrative on one sentence that could define her campaign. She has nothing. I mean, and that's what we need. I mean, we live in a soundbite world, but now we live in a Twitter soundbite world where make America great again is the easiest sentence for a drunkard to say. And that's really what you have to have as a campaign slogan, something easy someone drunk can say. Yeah, it's really stunning. I mean, I remember we were cracking up fingers and I when she first came out and wasn't her original slogan something like, I want to be your champion. Yes. And that lasted about yeah. a week. And now they're saying she's going to have to drop the gender card because it's not working. And they just they they have right. not been able to find a narrative that works for them. And it's because she's a horrible no person. And, you know, I, I honestly think she made a terrible strategic decision openly saying that uh, the Bill Clinton will be the head of uh, the head of the economy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because now he is theoretically running for govern uh, running, running uh, for president. You know, he, he is he has a government role. So when you mm-hmm. do attack Bill, people can't be like, well, Hillary's running. No, now she's put him in yes. her cabinet. So yes. he is running. Yes. You know, and I mean, it was a huge blow. And now we live in this era of Bill Cosby mm-hmm. and, uh, and um, Woody Allen. Right? These, these, the, the sex crimes of the elderly, of the current elderly, <laughs> are new fodder for the youth. 
And I think there is a little bit of ageism in it. I also think sexual norms have changed, uh, which uh, which uh, has sort of led to a flood uh, of accusations against these people that we've, that we've known for years. But, like, people are serious about it now. You know, the patriarchy, people talk about it, but it is broken in many ways. Uh, and I think specifically when it comes to uh, the, the normalization of men being allowed to be physically aggressive sexually with women, it just is, it is not... You, you don't look the other way anymore. It's not a cute thing. It's not, it's not dudes being dudes. It's a crime. So you have Bill Clinton, uh, who is just fitting perfectly into this narrative that is already existing across the, uh, across the world when it comes to hashtag activism. And, I mean, his sex crimes are going to come back to haunt her huge. And Donald Trump saying some negative things about his penis on Howard Stern, or positive things about his penis, yeah. negative things about uh, women on Howard Stern, are going to pale in comparison when he continues to play Juanita Broderick, discussing about how uh, how Bill raped her. Yeah. No, and nobody else no, would have it, gone it, there. If, if Ted Cruz had... No one would have gone there. One, he never would have brought this up. And I just... As somebody that hosts kind of like... A, you guys get into true crime on, on la, um, last podcast, but you also do some conspiracy stuff. So I wonder how excited you guys are that like all that's going to come around again. We're going to get Vince Foster stories. Maybe we'll hear a little bit about Waco. It's not even a conspiracy. They killed Vince Foster. <laughs> Absolutely. There, there were five, there were, you know, Jeffrey Epstein, who hung out with Donald and Bill. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I said it on today's topic, they played Ookie Cookie, but the name of the child was Cookie. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they had some disgusting things that they were doing with children. Uh, on the Lolita Express, the airline that Jeffrey Epstein flew everybody over on. These aren't even conspiracy theories. These are facts. Right, they right. killed Jeffrey Epstein. They, they, they killed uh, Vince Foster. I mean, how? I mean, and that's one of the things I like about him. <laughs> <laughs> but see, now they can't escape. That was the, the refrain when we were teenagers. You might have been a little bit younger than us in the 90s, Ben, but I was a teenager when all this stuff was going down, and you just kept hearing the vast right wing conspiracies out to get us. And now yeah. that's kind of so just blown out the window. It's like, yeah, no, no, it's really not. And you can't no. use surrogates well, to attack the- people. Right. I mean, the, you know, she just spent $1 million to get people who could be Twitter trolls on her behalf, right, which is just right. pathetic because it's a free service. But that's yeah. how non-engaging she is with the populace. It's phenomenal. And uh, you look at uh, the, the, the vast right-wing conspiracy, it's Twitter now. You can't yes. say that Twitter is a vast right-wing conspiracy. It's full of millennials who most likely uh, prefer, uh, you know, bathrooms to just be, uh, you know, in the public park. Mm-hmm. Without any walls around it. <laughs> it and, I mean, and they're Bernie Sanders fans. Exactly. Now, so do you the think Bernie's right wing, uh, conspiracy is nonsense? Right, it is. But do, do you think Bernie's going to go away quietly? No. You know, I mean, the, the funny thing is, I think that she has to put him on the ticket. I, I don't see how she doesn't. Um, because his fans, 11% said it outright they were, they were just voting for Trump. And around 30% uh, said they would not vote for Hillary, they would just stay at home. So she has to do something because that is a massive group of people in the Democratic side. And for if, if, if Bernie isn't going, he's taken it to the convention. He wants to get his uh, you know time in the sunlight, and uh, and he will. But I um, he can't win. I think he's going to stick around long enough to become the villain, quite frankly, by a lot of liberal cir- you know, in a lot of uh, mm-hmm. liberal circles. But uh, no, I, I, he, he sticks around. And I think if she's smart, she puts him on the ticket because. I can't see how else, you know, she's going to do what McKinley did with Roosevelt. Just put him on the ticket uh, and and just, like, call it a day to silence the dude. I I don't know if that'll happen. What do you make of I mean, you look look at... Right, no, it's a smart strategic move, but I don't know that it will go down. I don't know that he would agree to be on the ticket with her. Well, I mean, I don't know that either, but you look at what happened. I I know, I mean, you, you, you get the feeling now where he has a little bit, he has more bluster, and he's got a lot more ego than he did when he began. So you do get the feeling he, he would just take his, uh, you know, take his ball and go home and just, you know, continue to make money publicly speaking and things like that. But look at 79 with Reagan and, uh, and HW. They hated each other. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and they were able to come, uh, you know, to church. So I think they'll use it as a, as, a, as a beneficial thing. If he does win the presidency, they can say they never supported him in, uh, to begin with and then rail against his... Uh, uh, his reign, which exactly, which is exactly what it will be. Well, 
Be- before you go, please uh, go ahead and, and let everyone know um, you know where they could hear you because you got was it three podcasts, Ben? I got five now. Wow, damn. Um, which you know, some people. Th- I, I was talking to my friend. He's like, you're 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 spreading yourself too thin. But I don't think that that's true because I mean, let's be honest. Nobody gives a shit. You know, <laughs> no. Everyone is so self involved. You have to just like do so much to get any recognition whatsoever. So, um, right? Am I right? Yeah. Uh, I do the uh, the Ben Kissel show on all things comedy. Then I do the Red Eye podcast with Tom Chalou, Andy Levy, and uh, and the uh, another writer Tim Diamond, who's a great guy. Um, and then I do Able to Top Hat, which is the political show. I just had Gary Johnson on. Seth, maybe we talked about that before. And uh, Roundtable of Gentlemen, and of course the last podcast on the left. And follow me on Twitter at Ben Kissel. And I'm starting to use Instagram. I'm Ben Kissel one. I have 1,800 followers, and I'm like I have like eight. Instagrams, so I have to like, start doing that more. I never use the damn thing. So you found your password, or you just made a new account? Well, no, I found my password. It was a very simple password, but I hate pictures. I look oh. so bad in pictures, and everyone. I'm not, I'm not a hot model, with you know, I didn't get a Brazilian butt lift. I, there's no reason why anyone would want to see my Instagram, but uh, you know, I, I guess uh, some people do. So I'll I'll post some pictures, you know. Well, the fine oh, folks at Kmart disagree product. with that. Yeah. Hey, well, you know, they're looking for a new big and tall spokesperson, and I'll, I will be there. I will be their god. You know, <laughs> I will be the god of Kmart. And it's big. Blue light specials all day. It's not even, it's not even special anymore. It's just a blue light constantly. It's going to look like a rave in there. <laughs> there you have it. Ben Kissel, everyone. Thank Thanks, you, ben. ben. Thank you guys so much. My thanks go out to Ben Kissel and Ash Scow. Remember, you can always subscribe to the Enough Already podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and the TuneIn app. Music provided for the Enough Already podcast by YoPolyMusic.com. Thanks for listening. Have a great week.